everyone. Hello, hello everyone. Welcome back to Little History and uh, welcome back to God of War Ragnarok. We'll click over soon. But uh, Blue's not able to join us today, but I am joined by Red. Uh, Howdy. And uh, joined by our next very special guest, uh, Lynn Schoenbeck from the University of Edinburgh. Lynn? Do you hello. Wanna do you want to introduce yourself and what you do? Because it's all very cool. <laughs> sure. Um, I'm a PhD student at the University of Edinburgh. I'm in the Scandinavian Studies Department, and I'm currently looking at the use and introduction of Iron Age material into sort of the creation of a modern Danish cultural heritage, which is confusing and strange, but it's that's extremely very fun, spicy. Very Ooh, I love that. So cool. <laughs> oh, that's that's excellent. Because you, I know you also happen to have a degree in museum studies, in addition to where I met you with our other degree in Viking studies. <laughs> I sure do. So it's all kind of coming together. I'm looking specifically at museum exhibitions and how they're kind of feeding into that and how that's intersecting with immigration since like oh. World War II and migrant crises and everything to kind of get like a better handle on how like old stuff is being used so, in new nationalistic contexts. So Ooh. scale of one to ten, yeah. how much of this thesis is yelling at Jim Yingveld? <laughs> it's in there. I'm yelling at a lot of people. <laughs> I've been yelling at Tacitus since like March. Who? <laughs> I mean, oh, he God. deserves it. A man, a train wreck. When there's like no sources, you're like, oh, this guy was there. He referenced it. Can I use it as a source? And the answer is no. He made up like all of it. Absolutely so cannot it. use and this as a source. The problem is like a I'm lot so of scholars angry. since then have used him as like a definitive source. Well, yeah, he was there. He was like one well, of the only people who wrote shit down he, while he was there. He, he was there, but he never actually hand. mentions the Scandinavians by oh. name or Scandinavia <laughs> by name, nor did he ever actually go there. He stayed in oh Rome his entire life and just like wrote whatever because that's what armchair archaeology and anthropology was back then. Tacitus, you made me look like a fool in my syncretism to a video about it. Truly. <laughs> Chat, if you don't know, back then is the first century AD. It, it's yeah. old in there. <laughs> and the problem is people were still citing him in, like, the 50s, so it's True. like... <laughs> The, the, yeah. The, yeah. I mean, the first medieval attestation of Tastus is immediately the Pope calling on the Holy Roman Emperor to go on a crusade because, look, Tastus said you were cool, and that's what cool people do. Oh, so, cool people go on crusades, not losers. <laughs> exactly. The, the Man strong, single handedly like, set the table for the white supremacy movement. It's God bad. Yep. Damn it, Tacitus. <laughs> True. And in his defense, he couldn't have known where that would go. But... That's fair enough. That's that, fair that's enough. But I feel true. like anytime you point to like any group of people, I'm like, look at them. They are so natural and so strong. We love mm. them. They're so pure because they live in the nature. They're so handsome. And uh, so I, mean... handsome. I want to touch them. I mean, they're so strong. Strong nation. Strong I hope body. Hold me in their arms. No. It's like, Okay, cool. Yeah, and I mean, right, he's uh, writing a polemic against how effeminate and wimpy Rome is. Uh, so, no, yeah, he, he. Except he's not. If, <laughs> if he got strange. teleported forward 2,000 years, he would be an incel. Mm. I would fist fight Tacitus in the street. And I yeah. would win. <laughs> this is I true. Feel like he would be incredibly malnourished. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That man never knew what a potato was, and it He shows. doesn't know what vitamins are. <laughs> he sure doesn't. His he didn't go crumble. outside. <laughs> no, of course not. Uh, amazing. Uh, so, uh, let's actually, you know, talk about the uh, video game instead of yelling at Tastis all day, that we full, <laughs> we fully deck the Roman is a mood, um, and we should absolutely do that. Uh, but, you know, we're playing God of War Ragnarok soon. Uh, Assuming it doesn't randomly eject the disc again, maybe. Uh, the joys of oh. this specific PS4. <laughs> I, I hit I hit the wrong button, though, chat. Uh, you're going to see the wrong scene while I load a different save file. Oh, no! Because I, no. loaded, I loaded the Come game in eyes. which I played significantly farther ahead than we are today. So if you Whoops. were expecting Alfheimer and are confused as to why we're in Ausgarther, 
Uh, it's because I'm bad. <laughs> Spoiler alert. Avert that eyes, chat. <laughs> Cover your ears. Close your eyes. Don't look. Don't listen. <laughs> exactly. Uh, oh, and shit. as Raptorus notes, uh, to everyone who is tuning in, if you do like this, do make sure you click that follow button. Uh, you will all be thanked at the end with the credits that I definitely forgot to run last week. Uh, but there are credits, and you will all be thanked in those. Uh, and if you really like this, do consider subscribing to the channel, because it does, uh, you know, make any of this possible. Woo! Woohoo! Now let's load it's... the correct let's load, load the correct save file and then get into the video game. Yeah. Yeah. Games. Hooray. Uh Hooray. for people who did not make it last time, uh we took Tyr on a tour of Alfheimer and did a lot of murder and found out that our actions in the last game were bad. Um, and then Tyr got mad at us and left. Yeah, Tyr got real passive-aggressive about it on account of how he's not being aggressive-aggressive anymore. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Weak sauce. Come on, bro. Exactly. When is embracing your nature as a war god ever bitten anyone in the <laughs> Ever been franchise? bad in this game series. <laughs> exactly. What could possibly go wrong? He cried a lot of tears. Fire. <laughs> I see you in chat. Incredible. So the main objective is for us to go home so we can progress the main story. But, uh, um, you know, there's a sandstorm over here, and this seems we fine. We see this desert for ourselves. We love sand. It's so, fine. Look, yeah, exactly. everybody can trust prophecy. Exactly. Great but for I'm archaeology. Sure oh, actually. <laughs> I love how much this game discourages... This game and the previous one discourages you from just doing the main plot line, because every character will be like, hey, you know, if we, you know, wanted to hang out here for a while, I'm sure there's all kinds of interesting stuff we could find, and, you know, yeah. stuff we could see, and Kratos so himself being like, we don't need to rush. Don't you tell me what we're doing, Kratos. <laughs> exactly. Oh. You'll rush if I want you to rush. <laughs> Luckily, we don't want him to rush too much. Uh, I do want to highlight the random petroglyphs again, because I still have dubious feelings about those. <laughs> and they got more dubious, because I was thinking about the Dreamcatcher that we found last week, which is... Oh know, no! Just Did a Dreamcatcher. Really? We just fully oh, found no. a Dreamcatcher. Uh, let's, let's find it. Uh, in here somewhere. Well, no. I suppose that means that either Alfheim is being overtly Native American coded, or they just have a Forever no, 21 somewhere the... on the premises, you know? Exactly. Uh, they are luckily not uh, saying it's explicitly uh, Native coded, but a theory... The principle behind some magic is not a local one, but a theory picked up by Tyr from the Western lands. What that means, though, is that North America is just due west of Alfheim. And that doesn't make Great. me feel good. good. <laughs> Please refer to it in its proper name in the lore. It's Vinland, thank you. <laughs> oh, that's right, yes. <laughs> yes, because uh, in the Thule people definitely had dream catchers. Absolutely. Everyone knows that, you know, the entirety of Native American history is kind of a Uchronia, yeah. right? All yeah. that happens simultaneously and isn't happening anymore. That's all Correct. we know. Sorry. <laughs> exactly. Long story, but it's best when we keep uh, I will admit the one thing I like about uh, sort of getting really fuzzy with, you know, mythology and locations of what might be America is how many places have like the Western land is the afterlife. It's where you go when you die. And of course, you know, <laughs> you go far enough. It's that's California. <laughs> True. <laughs> Nobody dies in New York. You go to California. Be a man. <laughs> I think that's you what just pass into the West. <laughs> exactly. I think that's they what... They casually dump you in the Pacific. Rick, Rick Riordan, I think, actually covered this one. Yeah, yeah, of course. And if we had anything Boy, about, you know, Celtic mythology that wasn't Tacitus, and, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, then it would be very cool that, like, oh, the Irish afterlife, you know, you pass into the west in the ocean, and then you eventually come out the other side at Ellis Island, and that's the afterlife. It's like, that would be fun. That would be cool. <laughs> I, I have a lot of thoughts on how this could be incorporated into urban fantasy if I could believe that any of this were, you know, actual real historical beliefs, that it would be interesting to integrate. Anyway. True. Uh, and to be fair, as... I would categorize I Ellis Island as hell, so... Well, it yeah, tracks. So <laughs> oh, what Watcher is notif notifying us that we know specifically, in fact, where the Irish afterlife is. Oh, yeah? D do they have uh, more details? <laughs> we're working on it. Say more words immediately. Come on, guys. I, I have to know. Emmett. I have to put it on a map right next to Atlantis. Tech is actually probably pre-Christian, which is 
amazingly spicy, and they are continuing to write. Uh, hmm. Someone trained them to pull a sled. Lucky for us. So we will keep an eye on chat there. Uh, also, I ha instead of wolves in this one, uh, we have Gulon. We've got fun little critters. Who are they're blue. They're blue. They're blue lizard li lizard wolves. Uh huh. I think Love they're. It. I think they're from World of Warcraft. <laughs> uh huh. <laughs> they're kind of cute though. They're kind of they cute like, though. Like hyenas. Like, yeah, they've got the hyena vibe more than the lizard thing. I'd say. Yeah, but they do have scales. Funky. Huh. They do huh. fully have scales. They're hyenas with mange. Don't worry about it. <laughs> That's my favorite explanation for all cryptids. It's something weird with mange. It's got mange. <laughs> you know, it's, it's like, it's, it, oh, it's Bigfoot. It's bear with mange. Uh, chupacabra. Uh, wolf Coyote with mange. With mange. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. Always mange. Doesn't explain why it's walking on two legs, but don't worry about that part. It's probably just mange. <laughs> and that was, that, but it's a bear with mange, you know? <laughs> walking exactly. on two legs. Don't exactly. worry about it. It's mange. Yeah. <laughs> it's mange. <laughs> Whenever people are like, I saw the deer stand on two legs and walk away. That it wasn't a deer; it was bear with mange. <laughs> it was just bear with mange. <laughs> bear with mange. <laughs> Go inside, shut your doors, mind your peanuts. <laughs> Mothman is a weather balloon with mange. Yeah, now you're getting it. <laughs> Incredible. So uh, we can't see shit because it's a sandstorm. Excellent. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And so we're going to go over to the Whatever ginormous whale skeleton. I think the animals yeah, oh, okay. Excellent. Sure. Which realm is this again? This is still Alpine? This is Alpine. How do we reach it? Okay. There's, There's just sure. a ginormous, yeah. spooky whale skeleton. Uh, you can almost I, I see it. I played Breath of the Wild too, guys. It was very <laughs> fun. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and then we go inside. And we get the... Uh, inside the spooky whale skeleton, we have... Or something. We have rocks. Exactly. Excellent. Inside of every whale is many rocks. And then we're going to punch people a lot, and it'll be great. Excellent. Very obliging of these zombie things. Wait, what are these? Uh, the Grim. They're the annoying. They're the annoying guys that we met in Spardalpen because this game still has an enemy diversity problem. Excellent. I, they're, they're just like scaly humanoid things? They yeah. have mange. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. True. Wow, what a, a bear with mange. A lot of bears with mange in this game. It's a real <laughs> endemic problem here. <laughs> the bear population has just never been the same. Mm -hmm. And we'll... Okay, okay, person, uh, Tech Duin is referenced as an afterlife where non-Christian people go. This is specifically noted to be somewhere in slash under Bull Rock off the coast of Cork. If you look up an image of Bull Rock, you'll 100% see why people thought it was an underworld gate. And super weirdly, Dawn receives continued veneration into the 17th and 18th centuries. Actual legit pagan survival in Ireland is not true 99.9% .9 of the time. Dawn, utterly absurdly, actually is. That's very cool. Let me look up Bull Rock real quick. I gotta know. I just looked it up. Like. It looks cool as hell. I won't lie. And I get why people think that now. Oh, I see. Oh, that's wow. just a door. That's fully a door. Yeah, I um, love that. That that's got big, uh, you know, yeah, that's the right way to walk through energy. this. Yeah, <laughs> well, you know, there there are some locations where it's just like if you find the right, like that looks so intrinsically magical that like if you yeah. find the right way to walk through it, you'll end up somewhere else. Um, you will end up in California. Yeah, and I like how it's like this door on the right true. goes all the way through. You can see more ocean on the edge. Door on the left, hell. Exactly. <laughs> so fucking cool. Exactly. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Look, that's yeah. cool. That's my favorite thing. Whenever you get like a culture that has a very specific, like the location to the underworld is in this place. Usually you look it up and it's like, oh yeah, that's a literal yeah, hell like, mouth yeah. full of lava. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I see it. I get, I get it, it now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, that's so cool. And that's how you warp from Ireland directly to Ellis Island with that exactly. six-week boat journey. <laughs> but they will spell your name very wrong. That's well, what the right. You know, they, they, no. I mean, they do that to the, everyone. Yeah. What is more appropriate than weird otherworldly entities taking your true name from you from a certain yeah. point of view? Anyway. <laughs> okay. As my family, I think both sides of the family might have gotten got by Ellis Island. But, so, you yeah, know. Well, mm -hmm. it do be like that. <laughs> exactly. One of mine is uh one of those uh 
uh, I don't remember the exact specifics, but uh, th there's like Jewish naming conventions that were mostly like, you know, you don't have a last name, you are son of this person or daughter of that person. And I think in Germany or just in, in parts of Europe, they were like, all right, that's enough of that. You got to have a family name. And they were like, all right, that's why there are so many of these names that have like, they follow the Germanic naming conventions and it's just like a place or a thing that's like visible. Uh, like Hirsch, which just means deer, or like Goldstein, uh, or you know, that it was basically just like, all right, fine, you want a last name? We're, we're the fig tree family. It's, it's utterly You're coincidental welcome. that there's a fig tree in the backyard. Oh, it's always been our name. Boy, um, so, <laughs> I was born yeah. a fig tree. I'll die a fig tree. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, naming conventions are weird. They are. Yeah, they took my umlaut when I moved to America and got oh, American no. citizenship. I had to switch it to an OE, and I was like, all right. No! <laughs> yeah, it's bad. Because they were like, we don't have this letter on the keyboard. And I was like, you hit that doesn't feel you. like a good enough excuse. Yep, my, my family got hit with the asset. God, God absolutely rolled. Oof. <laughs> they get you. They'll get us every time. Yeah. Now I have two passports with two different names in them. <laughs> I'm sure this will be fine. <laughs> If the government didn't want you to look very complicated on the paperwork, they shouldn't have been weird about it. They shouldn't exactly. have done that. They should have gotten a separate keyboard. I was like, well, right like on, the, boys. It's like those, like, name fields that are, like, last name has to be at least, like, three letters long. And it's like, the the millions Most... of people in the world whose last name is you are like, all right, <laughs> yeah. thanks, man. <laughs> Good job, like, bud. I guess I won't. Yeah. yeah yep. <laughs> it's going to be my name in two spaces. You're welcome. Mm. <laughs> Yeah, it's All right, so they... strange that like we live in such a globalized world and yet we can't do that for people when they move to like different places. Well, we certainly could. It would just require yeah. you know a certain baseline level of like of human decency. <laughs> yeah, you know, effort. Yeah, trying. Oh God. Yum. Some yeah. of the shiniest looking websites are the ones that are utterly broken on the back end, and it's really frustrating. I. <laughs> I have a new insurance kicking in next year, and I tried to do the whole song and dance oh, about getting that no. activated, and it was like, we'll let you do the whole application, and then we'll throw an error. What's the error for? I'll never tell. So. <laughs> yep. Yeah, thanks. It's like, I'm trying to give you my money, and they're like, oh, who are you again? <laughs> anyway. It's like, we've yes. never heard of you. Yes, exactly. how strange. Okay. Uh... We need to identify three more poems because all these poems are other PS4 games. Oh yes, yes. Love okay, it. which yes. ones do we got? We so we had Ratchet and Clank, and then we had Death Stranding, and then we have this one. Uh, we're a little visions uh, after wrestling and wait for explorers crafted uh, by the imps. Uh, filled with visions after wrestling and wait for explorers. Imps is capitalized. That feels suspicious. It um, does. <laughs> Filled with music, joy, or horror, go, among go. fanciful realms, endless creation, and possibilities where the limit is one's own imagination. Is this like Psychonauts or some shit? Um, hmm. Hmm. I am not sure. Chat, if you recognize the game, uh, let us know, because I don't. What's that game where you're doing a time loop for like 20 minutes before the sun explodes? Uh, that's Actually, outer, I... that's... Outer, Outer Wilds. Wilds, right? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Spoiler alert, by the way. <laughs> the game. Spoiler alert. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and another one here: uh, "Tale Showing the Power of Visual Art" by Kvasir. Oh, hold on. They might say it's Pikmin. Uh, chat says it might be Pikmin. Uh, uh, they're all PS4 games. They're, last I uh, checked, Pikmin's a Nintendo property. Okay. A gentle boy in his brush found kinship along the walls. His creations playful spread. Town once empty now flush with color. Huh. I think someone else in chat said the other one might be dreams. Oh, the creativity tool. Yeah. Right. Okay, yeah. yeah. But the one about the power of visual art, uh, spirits within walls? Um, hmm. Yeah. Uh, I mean, my brain would just went Harold and the Purple Crayon, but then they specify <laughs> way more colors. So, <laughs> yeah, that one. Yep. All right. <laughs> and then the last one, uh, as they're figuring out that, uh, Celestial Construct. Celestial constructs. Um, guide your metal friend with care, or else it be dead. Rescue its friends. Experience tension. Immerse yourself in a new dimension. <laughs> Burma shape. Um, all right. Uh, uh huh. Guide your. Is there like a? The. They're mm. saying it's concrete genie. Uh, for the other one, for the for... The, the paint one. Yeah, I think so. Mm. I think so. All right, a PS4 game where you 
guide your metal friend with care, and then you get more metal friends. Yep. And uh, there's dimensions. And I just yep, don't play as PS games. No, um, these are all the weird ones, because the, uh, this is Astro's Playroom, according to chat, which is oh, another launch geez. title, like, tech demo for the PS4. That's a tech demo! <laughs> When are they going to bite the bullet and put in Shadow of the Colossus, for crying out loud? True. I was hoping uh, they were going to have a Last Guardian one. Ooh. Because... I mean, you know. You, you know, Fred. Of course, of course. Trico shaped Fred. Big cat rabbit dragon thing. Exactly. <laughs> Small boy throws barrels. <laughs> Don't get grabbed by the spooky guys. <laughs> True. Get more tats. A motto to live by. Don't get grabbed by the spooky guys. <laughs> get eaten by a giant cat rabbit thing. Acquire tattoos. Go home. <laughs> Good Saturday. Very fun. Mm. <laughs> I'm not a huge fan of Alfheim's sort of like decayed mushroom vibe. I yeah. I just don't like mushroom Fungus dimensions in general. Desert. Yeah, not my favorite, no. strangely. Who could have predicted that? Also, don't look at that door window thing if you have tryptophobia. Oh, True. yeah. yeah. Uh, it's just all holes. And just, it varies. Just, in my experience, like, a lot of things get classed under tryptophobia, but in, in general, it's, like, it's very specific. Uh, yeah, I would assume yeah. so. Yeah. Uh, it's fun. Uh, I... I don't want to derail from the Norse mythology stuff, but no, no, uh, please do. directly Where's... relevant to that is uh, the horror podcast Magnus Archive is like, it's, yes. it's, it's so good. And it has like, it, it basically is like, if you have any phobias anywhere, even ones you don't know about yet, we'll find them. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> we'll let you know. And for me, season one is like the perfect storm of trypophobia that I, that the, the kind that actually bugs me. Cause sometimes people will be like, oh, I got a trigger tag trypophobia on this like picture of the new <laughs> iPhone that has multiple cameras. And it's like that, that's, that's not that's it. That's fucking fine. <laughs> but like a friend of mine had like a um like a holiday wreath that had lotus pods in it and like I couldn't oh. look at his door like the whole time we were there. So Oh uh, no. Yeah, it's highly specific. Uh but the fun thing about the Magnus archives is season one is all about this lady who's got bugs in her. And uh Great. turns out I don't like that very much. <laughs> I don't think uh, a lot of people do. No, everything else I'm so macho about. It. It's like, oh, the vast. Ooh, I'm scared of space. No, give it to me. And then they, they do the bug stuff. And I'm like, never mind. <laughs> <'Cause> <laughs> I don't you want get to bugs in a woman. Yeah. Oh, I think God. this was just an optional one. Tragic. Well, nice I... work. <laughs> You've done it. I get boy. more loot. Mm. Excellent. Uh... We're going to be rich. Exactly. When I figure out where the hell... Nope, this is where I came in from. That's what the problem is. We can use all that money to pay off all the blood feuds we have going on. <laughs> we've murdered a lot of people up till now. Oh yeah, Odin will really appreciate that. <laughs> There's a we'll lot just, of know. families very angry with us. Hey look, yeah. Thor, Thor said he forgave us the blood price because uh, we got in a fist fight and we buried an axe in his stomach and that was good enough. And he yeah. said respect. <laughs> Like, yeah, we're fine. We're cool. It's all good. I love the characterization of Odin in this game. It's I've so watched the Let's Play, so I've seen weird. like all of it, but I like it. It's it's a very fun take on like a very serious character. Yeah, I mean, uh, when when he first showed up, I said he had like you know Hades, Lord of the Dead, how you doing vibes. Um, yeah. But my, um, my my dad was watching the vods of these streams, and he was like, "Oh, I know exactly who this actor is, and he's an interesting choice for Odin." And I was like, "Oh, okay, cool." Yeah. <laughs> so, Rad. That's all I got. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, he came and he was very like mob bossy, and I was like, "This is kind of fun," I because see, he yeah. does like do a lot of like extortion and like misdirection oh. in the lore. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. This one seems kind of unsubtle, which I think is a bummer. I like it when Odin is like sneaky sneaky, whereas this guy's just kind of like, all right, pay up or I'll break your kneecaps. And it's like, oh, he's so wise. <laughs> you really got I mean, the most knows, out of hanging on that tree. He knows you your kneecaps. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, wow. What what incredible knowledge he, he possesses. Sweet knowledge. Good Thanks, wisdom. Mimir and the, the well of Mimir. Whatever, it's fine. Yeah, he really um, gave his eye to learn that people like their kneecaps. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's one of those secret runes he learned. <laughs> exactly. The knee rune. It's it's that eighteenth one that he says no one will ever know is just kneecaps. It's the one that people <laughs> need their kneecaps. It's what he whispered in Baldur's ear at the funeral. He said, I'm gonna take your kneecaps and also <laughs> your life. 
Now he's sleeping with the fishies. Okay. <laughs> but his knees aren't. His knees ain't. <laughs> nope. Oh, his boy. two ravens are secretly he's... just knees. <laughs> I hate that. <laughs> Yo, me also. See, he, he sacrificed his eye for knowledge. He sacrificed himself to himself no. for extra knowledge. What did he sacrifice his kneecaps for? <laughs> the knowledge that most power. people like their kneecaps. <laughs> That's how he learned it. He learned yeah. by doing. Yeah, exactly. Good, excellent. <laughs> Look, there's a cave entrance. Oh, good. Atreus has told us we are finally getting to the place I'm trying to get to. Thanks, Thanks Atreus. Son. Thanks, Atreus. <laughs> Yeah, you know, when you have a really big open world game like this without really any obvious waypoints for where you're going yeah. or where you're supposed to be going, the way that you mostly measure progress is when you trigger the voice desert. lines for your escort characters. Yeah, exactly. Like, wow, yeah. we're getting close to where we saw X. Like, oh, oh thank God, <laughs> <laughs> This is the goddamn same. Thank you for being goddamn God dimension. <laughs> yup. In this wasteland. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And what's funny right. is that this game isn't actually, this area isn't actually big. Uh, it's just that you can't see shit, and so you just have to wander around. <laughs> Where well, am that I? render distance. Exactly. They're capable of rendering it, they just have a thing in the way. Mm. Turns out Sandstorm sucked. Oh. Sure no. What? I know, right? And are oh so common in Scandinavia, the land traditionally associated <laughs> with sand. Yes, exactly. known for having large quantities of sand to be stirred up by the yes. slightest provocation. The dunes of Reykjavik. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> I mean, I get it. They're like roped into having to do like different level designs to like keep things interesting. You can't just have it all be like thimble winter. Okay, but I mean, did. I wouldn't have complained. I'm just saying. Like, I'm, I'm sure they would have gotten some strongly worded comments, but. I Just I snow can't. everywhere. It's very pretty. It is yeah. very pretty. I also like how so much of the game in this section specifically is like, oh, we 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 messed up this realm when we were doing the thing last time, and and we we chose the wrong side to help out. Anyway, let's indiscriminately slaughter more dark elves. True. <laughs> We've already done the consequences of our actions, yeah. so we might as well just do more action. It's God of War. There is no diplomacy option, even though Kratos I was gonna say, is it's like... not God of Peace and getting along. <laughs> exactly. That that sounds like Kira's job. Our problems. Yeah. God of braiding each other's hair and talking. That sounds like about the opposite of Kira's job. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, it hasn't stopped him yet, though. So. Yeah. Although to be fair. Everyone else is the people who's hung up on like, oh, we, we messed up the culture of the elves, whereas Kratos is like, that's nice. Crunch. <laughs> anyway. He said that man might have money inside of him, and I'm going to find out. Hmm, nothing in his pockets, but I haven't checked his spine. <laughs> Kratos. Oh, look, there was five doubloons in there. So much hacksaw. Yeah. Exactly. It's like the mechanism they added in like Metal Gear Rising, where they were like, True. if you cut this guy open just right, you can pull a pack of Gatorade out of his spinal cord. <laughs> Yay! Hooray. The secret flavor. Yeah. <laughs> Tastes like healing. Mm, yummy. Hey, um, are you going to aggro on me, game? Game. <laughs> Don't let the game tell you what to do. Hit those men. Yeah. The, the problem is those men were supposed to come running at me so I could hit them, and they were not cooperating. They missed the timing. The choreographies of this is going to be all kinds of wrong. It's just whacking people with a giant axe. And they're being like, oh, hey, give them what for. It's like, oh, yeah, yeah. Because we've just agreed that it's totally it. kosher to be killing these guys. Exactly. <laughs> we had a big moral discussion, but let's just murder. Yeah, just do you know. murder. That I know By the way, I'm hard eight thirteen. Thank you for the <laughs> Prime subscription. Yeah, uh, yes. great time to remind people that if you have Amazon Prime, you have Twitch Prime, and if you have Twitch Prime, you have free subscriptions. And if you're not using them for anyone else, I would very much appreciate them. <laughs> I literally just learned that from you just now. <laughs> Amazing. I'm sorry. I've learned just... things. Something just clicked with me in the in the plot they might be setting up for this, uh, uh -huh. because it seems like what they are what they're kind of going hard on is that Atreus is learning about cycles of violence and really doesn't like it very much, and you combine that with the fact that he's been like, oh, I just don't know what Loki's supposed Patience. to do, and it's like, well, he's you? supposed to end everything. <laughs> he's yes. supposed to destroy the world so thoroughly that there is no cycle of violence afterwards, and. Uh, 
I don't know, that seems like a, a little bit of easy payoff for those two bits of planting that they might be aiming up towards. <laughs> Just like, oh, actually, the whole world is broken. Let's burn it all down. Yay! Yay. Let's try again. We'll, we'll, we'll get more on that in like an hour or so. Uh, Ooh, when, we, when we'll actually get to capital P plot. Ooh, <laughs> we be love still my plot. heart. <laughs> I love plot. I. It's not always I, maybe like it's them. because I'm not the one playing Some these games, but I'm always like, God, they take their sweet fucking time getting anywhere. Yeah. No, that, that, that's mostly me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nah, I'm just trying to pad out the violence as long as you can. <laughs> exactly. Maybe if we go back, the Dark Elves will have really? respawned. More bone money. Give it to me. <laughs> Kratos heard the term man over. price and got a little bit confused <laughs> over what exactly that meant. Said, what do you mean the blood price isn't in the blood? I've been <laughs> looking everywhere. That would be the most efficient method of storing. <laughs> no, sure it would be. It's in their families. Ah, <laughs> oh, of course. I will murder their family. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Kratos, they need to be alive to pay. I don't no, understand. No, no, no. <laughs> their money is inside of their bodies. We learned this. It's gonna explode. In my, my experience killing gods, you can find many useful things inside them. <laughs> Flashlights, you know. More flashlights. Upgrades for my sword, which you would think couldn't get me sharper, but don't worry about it. I'll just stick a rune stone to it, and then it will get strong. He's like gluing it, you know. <laughs> yeah, he's just got like a hot glue gun with him at all times. Exactly. I'll stick this rock to my axe, it'll go fast. Sindri is just in the background, like, no, that's no, why is that working? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Poor man's getting put out of a job by a glue gun and some can do attitude. <laughs> yeah. I'm just trying to figure out why you'd help some Excellent. random man. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, no, no, it, it okay. is. Okay. Uh, also, we had a nitpick redeemed uh, because Ooh. channel points can do. As you accumulate channel points, you can use them on a wide variety of rewards. Uh, some of which are even fun. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh. <laughs> My my personal nitpick continues to be the petroglyphs just like vibing around, but Lynn, you know the archaeology much better than I do. Uh, what's the status of like petroglyphs in Scandinavia uh, in like the turn of the Iron Age? So I can tell you some stuff about petroglyphs. Let's it's go. not like entirely my forte. I wrote a very small paper about it many years ago, and it was about more than either of us. Exactly. <laughs> It was specifically about petroglyphs in southern Sweden, Ooh. and they're only, if you Google, I will put it in chat. Hold on. Yes. Can I spell? We'll never know. <laughs> I know the answer to that. Uh, it's for you and me both now. <laughs> it's bad out in these streets. There it is. So if you Google anything along the lines of, like, Bohuslan ship petroglyphs, you'll find them. And they're really, really fun. They're these, like, tons of petroglyphs just, like, on the rocks in Bohuslan, Sweden. And they're ships, and there's, like, little people inside of the ships. Um, and what's interesting oh! is that they're... Yeah, yes. you probably know what they look like. Yeah. Yeah. I What the fuck <gasps> video was this for? Uh, it it <laughs> might have just been Loki. It might have been Wild Hunt. I was doing something uh, where I was looking up, like, the, the ship burial practices. Uh, yeah. And how, like, like boats are in these people's blood. Uh, and this is also where they had that first, like, sun glyph that people yeah. found. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's all there in that area of Sweden. And what's interesting is that, like, you only find them along, like, the coasts. You don't find yeah. them further inland, which is probably just because, like, they're pictures of ships, so, like, big boats. And if you're sailing or, like, traveling along, like, rivers and streams, you're going to be using, like, little canoes and, like, little one-man things. They're not going to be, like, big ships that you would use, like, in the open ocean. Yeah. And so there's probably going to be, like, less representation of that. But they're really interesting. They're really fun. They're so and, cool. Yeah, they're really interesting to look at. And the way that they, like, show the little people is just, like, a line with a circle for the head. They're amazing. Yeah. Except some of these guys also have clearly visible dicks. <laughs> Don't worry about that. It just makes the boat go faster. It's <laughs> strength. It's, it's aerodynamic. <laughs> if your sail falls off, everybody just put your dick in the wind and you'll go fast. It'll be good. It'll Yay. be fine. 
But it's really interesting because I feel like this happens a lot historically, is that like human beings, when you have like petroglyphs and like cave paintings and things like that, the people are always sort of like the last thing that gets kind of like realistically depicted. Yeah. Because you have it even in like cave art from like 40, 50,000 years ago, where you have these like incredibly intricate and accurate depictions of like animals. And yeah. things, and when you do see people, it's like the single most like abstract thing that you could be like, if I squint, I guess that would be like a human being. And so it's always like a really interesting kind of like juxtaposition where like the object that we as people see is always like a very concrete thing, but then like how we picture ourselves is very abstract. It's strange. Yeah. yeah. I'm gonna uh, take the opportunity to again bring up that my mom made a video about the caves of Lascaux, uh, which is yes. kind of a deep dive into like the the different portrayals of the animals and how a lot of them were clearly painted in different eras, although most people who write about them don't bring that up explicitly. They'll just be like, they were painted with different materials and some of these are layered on top of each other. And it's like, that means it was different people. Um, anyway. <laughs> yeah. Uh, my my mom has this very interesting habit of knowing just an absolute fuck ton about the history of like art and art materials and stuff Love and it. casually realizing things about like news stories and then being like well obviously like um there there was this thing a few years ago where they were like oh we found this like this other copy of the Mona Lisa that was uh, probably painted by Da Vinci and she looked at it immediately and she was like that's not Da Vinci he didn't use canvas and it's like oh of course <laughs> Everybody. Sorry, mom. Knows. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, it's just like when I was like looking through the news articles, and they were like, "It's unconfirmed," and I was like, "Wait, they don't, they don't know, <laughs> mom, they don't know." Um, and with Lasco, she was like, "Yeah, you know, the the, the famous like Lasco unicorn is so clearly like a painting of a different animal, and then somebody yeah. like crudely like spray painted two horns on it, like." <laughs> probably centuries later and they were like it's a it's got horns now it's a horned animal it's not that that horse thingy it was before it's something new <laughs> something important to our culture uh and she was just like yeah so anyway so but yeah the the, the depiction of like different animals is often extremely anatomically detailed and yeah. of course there's that thing about like uh, cave art with the sort of noodle like the spaghetti lines over it that yes that nobody knew the point of until someone went in with like a like uh, a torch and saw how the firelight and the lines together produce the illusion of movement makes it wiggle yeah no it's yeah. and that's crazy yeah but like, that's were incredibly movies. like intricate artistic skill to be utilizing at a time where like art has only existed theoretically for like a couple thousand years as like an industry and to already be like if you hold up like a flame to it, we have created 3D movement. Yeah. And yet Although, human beings are still only being depicted as like sticks. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, the thing about um the uh the firelight that makes sense is like that had to be how they were painting them in right. the first place. Like they had to have brought a right. torch in it. So it would have been pretty easy to be like, oh fuck, I got the head wrong. I'll draw it again in the other position and then be like, whoa, it looks like it's moving it. its face. <laughs> yeah. Um so it's, I mean, it's, it's so interesting. And of course, like, it that's is. the kind of, that's the kind of information that doesn't get preserved, you know? No. Uh, no. It's, and, I yeah. love it. I love anything like Paleolithic art that's stuff. It's so interesting. They're like arguing now whether or not Neanderthals were creating art because mm. they found like some really old, I forget where, probably like in Spain, uh, <laughs> in a cave yeah. somewhere, they found like really, really old, really weird petroglyphs that were basically just like hatch marks and like, lines that look kind of like a ladder and don't really Ooh. look like anything that's being like produced later because it's nothing like animalistic or like anything like that like it's not anything that looks concretely like anything in nature unless you're like oh my god they invented ladders but like that's probably not what it is <laughs> probably not and so there, that's like the big debate is like was that neanderthal art because it was happening right at like the end of like oh, neanderthal yeah. the start of like cro magnon and it's one of like the big debates is like could Neanderthals like speak the way that we do? Like, did they have burial practices the way that we do? Did they have empathy the way that we do? Do they create art the way that we do? Because historically people have been very like hesitant to ascribe any of those values to anything that isn't like homo sapien humans. Yeah. But I mean, because I think we, <laughs> it, yeah. I, exactly, and it's like, it's very likely that we learned things from Neanderthals because like we were living with them closely enough to have like interbred with them. So like, yeah. it, which implies that it wasn't always like an antagonistic relationship. No, I, I feel like the idea that like the Neanderthals went extinct because we killed them is like, it's it's a little bit, I don't know. 
uh, depressing. Just, like, well, that too, but it's like, yeah. Like, obviously there is the question of like, well, why, you know, how did, how do we have so many like human subvariants then, but none of them now? And it's like, well, we can sequence our own DNA and find Neanderthal DNA in there. So presumably what happened is not, we killed all of them. It's, we had a bunch of kids together and stopped being two distinct groups. Like, right. That's the easiest explanation, but people really like this idea that like, oh, we're inherently warlike and like yeah. it's in our nature to kill. I, I like the the really cynical part of me wonders if that narrative is so popular specifically because it sort of um, what's the word uh, absolves us of like any sort of personal responsibility because if you go looking for like what are the patterns of human behavior in the earliest forms of you know society, it's like uh compassionate medical care for the sick, injured, and elderly. Yep. Flowers for burials. Uh, children getting special, like, treatment in yep. burials. And, and, like, uh, kids hanging out with dogs and exploring caves by torchlight. But people really want it to be violent. Yeah, and it's really sad because I think you're absolutely right that, like, when you look at, like, the record, it's empathy is, like, yeah. the thing that allowed us to build We're groups social and civilization. Animals. Yeah. yeah. What that social means animals is that... <laughs> Yeah. There's, like, variation in, like, what constitutes having, like, value. Because I think, like, the big one that people point to is the burial in, I think it's Iraq, Shanidar? The mm. Shanidar cave. And Shanidar 1 was um, a person that they found who had had, like, severe injuries while alive. Like, he had, like, a partially crushed head, he had had, like, a broken right. arm hey, and everything. But there was close. signs of That's healing. Hilarious. Which yeah. meant that somebody had taken care of him, yeah, and somebody he, had he fed him, and, and like, thing. he lived a There's long time, he lived into, like, his 40s or his 50s, like which was essentially the best you could hope for at that, that point as a healthy person, yeah. let alone yeah. someone who had, like, severe injuries like that. And it implies that there was, like, medical knowledge yeah. there, at least to, like, provide pain relief and to, like, splint injuries, but it's, it's exactly that. It's, like, the first thing that we see is always empathy. Mm -hmm. And I think oh people always well, want to assert, like, well, we fought for, like, our survival. There's kind of, like, that idea that, like, we were the last bad. ones who made it. We're the ones that are here oh, because well, we fought for that uh -huh. spot. Sure. As if yeah. evolution isn't just, like, luck at the draw and being in the right place at the right time to, like, yeah. happen to survive. Like, there's not really much you can do to sort of, like, bend your own, like, evolutionary yeah. path. It's just sort of, like... You're gonna get what you're gonna get. Yeah, it's all about your environment and what traits of yours yeah. help in what go. environments. Uh, and like, people really like hearing survival of the fittest as like, yeah. I'm the fittest, I'm the buffest, I'm the, I'm the coolest guy around, and that makes me, you know, that's why I'll survive anything. And honestly, I feel like a lot of that is just, it's a response to fear. It's like, I don't want to believe that there are things out there that can just, you know, end my entire way of life without any input from me that I can't do anything about. So instead, they're like, if I just get buff enough and, like, tough enough, then I w I'm guaranteed to be okay. And it, it, it comes from a place of fear, but, you know, that's why it's that's why it turns so hostile. But the, the idea that, like, oh, yeah, the fittest survive, and that, that means they had to be the strongest, the people who could, right. like, hurt the most other people and drive them away is, like, uh, you know that we don't do that now, right? And in right. fact, <laughs> have never done that for the majority of human history. Like, periods of wartime and unrest are notable because of how shitty they make everything. Like, they're the, they're the shiny exception that kind of proves the rule that that's not how we normally function. And, it's like, it, we, we know species that are kind of, like, aggressive and violent and, and predatory and stuff like that. Um, and they don't tend to be as social as we are. And I, I think a lot of people just really want an evolutionary, hard-coded, pseudo-biological reason for why it's okay and even encouraged for them to be a dick. Um, There's a really, really good article. I will find it and I will link it in chat. It's called What the Caves Are Trying to Tell Us. Ooh. And it's it's so good. Every like I read it every once in a while just to like refresh myself because it's yeah. so beautifully written. Um, but it talks, I'm hoping that links out correctly. Is someone Ooh. tell me if it, it does did not. not link out it correctly. It looks like there's a, there's a comma in there, but I think if I copy paste the whole thing, it'll let me see. It. Excellent. Otherwise yep. it's just what the kids Ooh, yes, are there it is. trying to tell us. Um, and it basically talks about how people always sort of cite like deep history, um, as sort of like the reason for why, like we have modern gender roles. Mm -hmm. um and it, it specifically talks about this like 
terrible trend of like evolutionary <sighs> psychology where it's like oh yeah. women like the color pink because like when you were foraging like you wanted to pick pink berries and like oh, men like the color blue because it reminds them of like the sky when they were like out hunting <laughs> Um, and it, I knew it, a guy it, in high school who possibly who was ironically that. believed that. Uh, uh, <laughs> it was a little so hard to tell bad. with that guy, but yeah. And uh, it, it just, like, sheesh. talks about, like, how people always sort of cite that and then goes into basically talking about, like, the people who, like, drew those pictographs and, like, the cavemen and, like, early fun. men that we kind we of, like, rely on for that narrative. None of what they were doing was for us like no. no one was living in that moment and like drawing on walls or writing on walls as like a message to the future <laughs> and that maybe that stuff isn't for us to understand and like as much as we want to as much as we want to like connect yeah. to the past and as much as we try to like figure out what were they trying to tell us it's like well they weren't trying to tell you anything yeah they didn't know you existed they didn't care no, what, they didn't what are care. we doing for you for and like why are we pinning like our modern ideas of like anything onto like a past that has nothing to do with us right and also like what are we doing for the people ten thousand years right. <laughs> seriously like we we can't even agree to stop pumping carbon dioxide in the atmosphere you really think we're trying to write messages that people ten thousand years in the future will understand like that, that that's a whole genre of like specifically the people who are trying to do long-term nuclear waste disposal i was about to say the only one i know is the nuclear waste ones where they're like don't come here it's a bad place as if that wouldn't immediately make me go like i want to know what's in treasure hell yeah but like that, that that's the thing like we don't we don't I, know what I don't know what context say. they would need because that's not how we think. Right. You know, we think about We're us and we think maybe out. about like our immediate future and sometimes like people that's think about grandkids. Right. Uh, but even then, it's it's on a personal scale. It's like, what can I leave to them? Like, what kind of house will I be able to give them? Right. You know, uh, it it doesn't get into the level of civilization. And like, no. I feel like I think that media representation of prehistoric times does us all a disservice by putting everyone in like leopard skin tunics and like with with clubs and you know fire hot and oh, stuff like that because it's that. like <laughs> the, look 10,000 years of evolution is something but like on Maybe. on an evolutionary scale places, you wouldn't find out more probably identify them as a different myself? species like you no. look at them and be like that's a person you know whenever people see reconstructions they're like wow that's a person it's like they're all people that's yeah. the thing like we have knowledge and experience that they did not have but that's the only thing that's practically speaking separating us from them. We can probably assume that all other things being equal, they acted like people do. Yeah. 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 Anyway, it's it's incredibly interesting. And I it is. I feel like I mean, I complain endlessly about how we have so little sources for Norse mythology, but like I feel so bad for the people who are doing any sort of like Paleolithic <laughs> research because it's even less and the theories are even dumber because so many <laughs> more people have access to grime. Yeah. <laughs> No, it's Sheesh. it's interesting and it's strange. And I think like the thing is we want to know a lot more than I think we're ever gonna be able to like find out barring like the invention of a time machine. And even yeah. then, I feel like if you went back in time, so many people have so many varying opinions on like what happened back then that like half the people wouldn't believe what they saw yeah. anyway. It's like, oh my God, is that like two people raising a baby together i cannot believe like oh, i thought no. that was woman's work what yeah or, or right. like, wow i can't believe it this woman has to some kind of independent career or look at that those gay people are happy together i oh, thought no. that wasn't allowed before <laughs> 1990 it's like look like it's Good. easy to look at the past and see everybody black as black you know shadows on a cave shield. wall is like okay yeah, these are just natural. these are abstractions natural. of people um well and you can you know you can evo psych your way through that it's like oh it's the monkey sphere you know we just can't conceive of them as people Thanks. it's like stop looking in your dna for excuses of how you act as a person yeah. you know yeah. you, you, it's you can't like blame are... the fact that you're an asshole on a caveman <laughs> somewhere sixty thousand years ago that's not how it works people just are grow like up. It's like they're desperate to find a way to strip away their own free will yeah. and find a way to be like, I'm not responsible for my behavior because yeah. it, it was basically like, it, you know, you have like Calvinism, you have predestination. And then like the new version is like, oh, well, you see, uh, I, I'm, I'm sexist because uh, my DNA makes me be. And it's like, oh, cool. Yeah. What about everyone in the world who isn't? Oh, well, you know, they're denying <laughs> their true nature. Oh, so you have the free will to deny your nature. How right. interesting. <laughs> anyway, I mean, it's not it's not a logical argument, so it cannot be right. fought with logic, you know? It's right. someone has a, a thing they believe and they are finding ways to justify it. And if you prove that one of those ways is wrong, they'll just find another one. Right. Um, 
So, but it is still fun to pick apart because it's like, oh, oh yeah, it's <laughs> so you love a good oh, argument. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I have a big Jewish extended family. I've been here before. <laughs> <laughs> well, you yell about love anything. Thanksgiving. Yeah. <laughs> True. Uh, sheesh. Okay. Uh, yeah, another another that. That example Norse of historical history, but... of yeah. historical <laughs> empathy, though. Uh, you know, Kratos being not a terrible dad, and that is what we call a segue. <laughs> yes, we do love it. You love yeah. to see it. He cares yeah. about his son. He loves his son's interests. He, he doesn't understand, but he's yeah. trying. Exactly. Trying, yeah. And he goes on this big quest to free a ginormous jellyfish because he yeah. knows it will make Atreus happy, and they want <gasps> to just hang out for a bit. That is That's cute. how you be a good dad. You know what would be the funniest way this could come back? If Atreus later turns into a giant jellyfish. True. <laughs> He's like, I thought jellyfish it was just for normal war. animals. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, amazingly, uh, turning fully into Norse mythology, though, the giant jellyfish is sort of a reference. Uh, someone also did yes. find a... Someone else did find a reference for the Gulon, the, these guys. Uh, the 16th century from Olaus Magnus's Carta Marina, which is... Ooh. Spicy. Uh, but this, spicy. this, we mentioned it last week, is a Havguva. We love the Havguva. This yeah. is what a Havguva is probably looking closer to like. Because uh, yeah. a Havguva is, is the other kind of giant whale. We have the Lingvaker, which we saw earlier. And we have the Havguva, which apparently is over there now. Uh, but they're both just giant whales. Time. Those Great. Were and so the jelly. We were wondering in the trailers what the heck are the jellyfish doing in Norse mythology, and the answer is they got made up. But they're cute, so we like it. Artistic license. Honestly, this change I don't mind. I, I th like no, this is fine. Yeah, it's like okay, it was a big oceanic animal, and now we have a better understanding of what that might have looked like. Uh, you know. And you already did like uh, the whale in like the earlier. You yeah. know, that's not Area. a bad read uh, in chat, Ulfjafnar Berserker, which is a uh, shorter name. Uh, notes, yeah. Hans Egeda <laughs> wrote about the equated the Havgova and the Kraken, and oh, pop culture, which is I true, mean, again, 16th century, but pop, he means that they're both whales. Uh, pop culture reads that and says one of them's a squid, and jellyfish look vaguely like squids, maybe? I don't know. Alternately, they just like the visuals. People, I was gonna say, I mean, I do love it, just a giant jellyfish floating through the sky. It's it's very pretty. I, I think that big ocean animals in the skybox is a very good look. Uh, it's a good look. For any sort of fantastical setting. Yeah, um, I agree. Yeah. I also feel like people just really like drawing lines between vaguely similar things across cultures and being like, look, they're all sea monsters. <laughs> Wait, look at that. <laughs> the Kraken and the whale. Woo! I feel like if something's smashing your boat to pieces in the middle of the Atlantic, you're not really going to be looking to see what it is. Uh, By the way, red, like red. bigger fish to fry. You may want to look at what Mimir is saying right now. Because uh, it's Bane. relevant to your interests. <laughs> Next thing you know, he's helping matters a lot. I missed the first part. Uh, murders the king. Oh, for fuck's sake. <laughs> <laughs> Delicious. I love a good Ukronia. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we've known that Mimir is Puck since last game, when he called himself a Merry Wanderer of the Night. Exactly. Um, Physical. But yes, it is one for... Uh, one of the stories from his homeland, namely... Shakespearean times! <laughs> his homeland of 1600s England. Or should I say, the Scottish play. Because a name so cursed no one dares speak it sure is the Scottish play moment. I really gotta write these stories down God, it's fucking stupid. <laughs> it's like, it, it's cute, but also, come on! They're yep. really trying. <laughs> There's so much stuff from Norse mythology that they aren't First integrating into this into game, it. and yeah. they're like, "Why? Why would you? Why would you oh, foolishly believe that the, the myths worst. would be true?" And then Mimir's well, like, "Let me tell you about my favorite play. Fine. You know, <laughs> you know the play. <laughs> you know the one. <laughs> yeah, the one that with the name that oh, we dare not speak." Um, <laughs> Huzzah. Yup. Well, Let me tell you about that time I hung out with four guys in the woods, and they were riding bicycles, and I made them all kiss each other. God damn it, Mimir. Uh, what is it <laughs> exactly. Uh, we also. Let's see. Let's go to Nilfheim, because we haven't been there yet, and we have enough things to. Uh, get our first reward from the. 
uh, ravens that we've been murdering. Excellent. While weird. you do that, I will take a bathroom break. Amazing. Yeah. Also, I'm sorry, was Kratos, just, like, was, was Mimir just trying to teach, uh, Atreus, no, like, like a dirty joke. S S <laughs> Sindri said that Brock was banned from Alfheim for a uh, dirty reference, and Atreus was like, what? Mm. And everyone else is like, no. Ah, uh, I see. <laughs> yes, this is just Brock. Be doing that Brock makes more things. sense. Yes. The Lake of Souls? So long as uh, we've got you know what would be the funniest direction? way this could possibly go? Because yeah, people in chat are like, wow, Mimir is Shakespeare, and it's like, you know, if... If the reason why he wear that stupid ruff is to keep his head <laughs> on whatever nightmare body he was puppeting under there. That would be very funny. <laughs> that would be an extremely funny. It's very like, you know, the velvet ribbon or whatever. Exactly. Style. Short story. Welcome to we Niflheim. Oh. We can do infinite training in Niflheim. Uh, or we can go talk Wait. to the birds. I love the Christmas tree look of the, you know, the lights and the... Once we've been destroying all this <laughs> oh time. no. So I also love the Fortress of Solitude look they have with those crystal structures. Yep. That's definitely Free from the mythology. Right. That is cool. All the glowy birds on the on the snowy tree, they know what they're doing. That's know. pretty. They do. It's very pretty. The environment artists for this game are incredible. Okay, most of the designers for this game are incredible, but uh, <laughs> the environment artists right now particularly deserve a shout out. Yeah, this one's very nice. And I love that, like, you're getting the really weird curled frost effects that happen when it's, like, so cold for so long that the wind starts shaping stuff. Yeah. It's very pretty. Yeah. I've returned. Hello. Welcome back. Hello. We, uh, as we murder ravens because. Odin doesn't just have Hugh and Immune, and he's got a bunch of random glowy ravens. Oh, we're killing these ravens, too. As as we murder them, uh, they become happy about this and give us free stuff. What? Great. So it's just Very like a target practice mini game. <laughs> it is. Uh, if you watch me miss uh, a bird flying in circles for five minutes, that's why. <laughs> Hooray. Love it. God, that's wild. Oh, actually, we can do some upgrades. <laughs> yeah. I should remember yeah. to upgrade my gear so that we stay on top of this. Also, yes, are we out of Alfheim for the duration, or are we going back? We are out of Alfheim for the duration. We are Perfect. done with Alfheim for All right. the Good foreseeable time to start yelling future. about it then. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh, boy, because I, I promised it in my, my tweet about it. It's just, okay, Here here's the thing. A couple days ago, I messaged Adam, and I was like, hey, I think I want to do a video about the Nine Realms, more wow. specifically about how there aren't Nine Realms. Like, the, the word Nine Realms gets thrown around, but, like, we don't know what they specifically are. And I think that would be fun. And he was like, yeah, yeah, that would be fun. Let's start compiling lists and stuff. You know, I was going through my, my references and, and the, the generally accepted like list, just to else. start, the one that Hang on, I can, get, I can get you the list. I can get you the list. Uh, <laughs> I have the list. It's right I have here. my notes up. Yeah. Um, I have the list. We've got yes, a visual uh, right here for you. <laughs> yeah. Um, in the Henry Adam Bellows translation of the Poetic Edda, uh, at the very beginning of the Volspa, you know, nine yep. worlds I knew, the nine in the tree, they don't list them, nope. but Henry Adam Bellows in the footnote is like, okay, here's what they probably are. Asgard, Vanaheim, Alfheim, Svartalfheim, Midgard, Jotunheim, Muspelheim, Niflheim, and the ninth, ninth world is uncertain, but the translator says it is presumably of the dwarves, perhaps Nidavellir. Um, so that's Spider the thing. one that most people go on. That's the one that they have in, like, you know, Marvel for the most part. And that, that, that tends to be the one people stick with. But if you look even a little bit below the surface, everyone is yelling all the time. True. <laughs> but I have my own <laughs> grievance, and it's with Alfheim, because it's canonically not its own realm. <laughs> and so far as we can identify a canon. We... Smart Alfheim has even less evidence for it. I don't think it's ever named. <laughs> The prose edda. It's implied. <laughs> yeah, it's implied. In the prose edda, Snorri's like, oh yeah, the Light Elves, they live, they live like in Asgard, in the part of Asgard that is Alfheim. That's explicit. He puts it in the list with like, this is where Thor hangs out, this is where Balder hangs out, and this is Alfheim, where the elves hang out, and for other parts of Asgard, and it's like, okay, so Alfheim isn't a realm of its own, it's just a part of Asgard. And Snorri's like, and specifically the light elves hang out there, the dark elves, they're they're elsewhere, they're they they, they look very different and they live under the earth. So people are like, oh, okay, the dark elves must be their own thing. Or perhaps they are just another word for the dwarves, which kind of just means that anyway. Um, so that's that's more of the yelling. Uh, and also, this is Snorri, who we already don't trust. Um, 
Yeah, just, just, if, if we had any other sources, it would be great, but no, it's Nori. Um, and the thing is, like, Alfheim is referenced in, uh, let's see, uh, in the Poetic Edda in uh, Grimnis Mall, uh, it's, it's listed alongside every other, like, individual god realm. Um, and it's just, it's so explicit that it's not its own realm. Either it's not its own realm, or all of these individual places... Uh, Throthheim and, uh, and, uh, Gladschild? Uh, well, uh, yeah. We'll Folkvanger, uh, yeah, and see, Valhalla, the they're all their own realms, Indeed. or Alfheim isn't its own realm, and neither is Svartalfheim, which takes the number of confirmed I mean, realms down from eight-ish to six, which is probably why people are like Alfheim and Svartalfheim. Well, why the fuck not? Because yeah. <laughs> it's just They have hate in the name. That clearly is sufficient like evidence. evidence. Yeah, that means the place of. <laughs> also, in the, the prose Edda, uh, in, in Gilfaginning, uh, uh, Alfheim is listed as one of the sacred places of the gods right next to Erd's Well at the base of Yggdrasil. Which means it's another region that has exactly as much evidence as Alfheim for being a realm of its own, possibly more, because in the Poetic Edda, uh, the Well of Erd is specifically where the Master Norns Kratos, live, and that's I kind of a big deal. You. Like, that's important. Um, anyway, it's a speak. nightmare. If um, you are ever in need of my services, and I am not present, yeah, it's a mess. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's extremely fun. We're up to 15 out of 9 realms, and I'm, we're, I'm on, not done. Hold on, let me, <laughs> let me do the final count. Uh, all right, so so in the definitely their own realms category, in the reference multiple times, we have Midgard, which is something, Asgard, Vanaheim. Refer it's referenced enough that the Vanir are somewhere else, and only the ones in Asgard are like the hostages that were exchanged in the Eyes of Vanir War, so Vanaheim has to be its own place. Jotunheim gets referenced a whole bunch, it's very important. And number five is Niflheim. It's not Niflheim. Niflheim is a Snorri invention. Niflheim is referenced by name several times in the Poetic Edda. <laughs> and it's also referenced in the Prose Edda. They say, oh yeah, uh, wicked men go to hell and on to Niflheim, which is the ninth world. It's explicitly canon. And then he's like, also, there was Niflheim, which with Muspelheim, which was also never in the Poetic Edda. They combined together and created the stuff that turned into Midgard later. Woo! So anyway, um, <laughs> Jesus Christ. Uh, and then in the dubious candidates category, we've got Alfheim, which, as mentioned, isn't a realm of its own, but that's fine. Uh, Nidavellir has one reference in the Poetic Edda. It's a, it's where a golden hall is located for Sindri's race, aka the dwarves. So th that, that's decent evidence that it could be a place where dwarves hang out. That's fine. I don't mind making Nidavellir one of the realms. That's cool. Uh, unfortunately, if we do that, we also have to do Okolnir, which nobody's ever heard of, but is in the exact same stanza as Nidavellir and has exactly as many words dedicated to why it's important. Uh, there's a mead hall there that it belongs to a giant who might also just be Ymir again. Uh, oh shit, I lost count. Hold on. Um, so that's eight. We're up to eight now. Uh, and there's more. Obviously, there's Erd's Well, the same as Alfheim. Uh, Muspelheim is only referenced in the prose edda. It's not referenced in the poetic edda except by implication in that there is a place where Surtur hangs out and the sons of Muspel will ride out of it. Um, Niflheim is in the same boat. It's kind of just implied to be like a primordial dimension of cold, maybe. Uh, Idavol, yes, the field where the gods gather before and after Ragnarok, its location is never listed, so it could be a place of its own. Uh, also, Nidafjol, I'm saying all these wrong. Uh, Adam, feel free to correct me at any no, point. Neither, you actually that. said Nidafjol very close. It's just oh, I slanted yeah. double L's. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, so that that one is the realm below the, the world tree that the Nidhogg flies out of after Ragnarok and then gets its ass beat. Uh, it literally means the Dark Mountains doesn't narrow it down at all. That could be anywhere. Speaking uh, of which, Adam... I just threw my axe at that dragon question mark. <laughs> Hell yeah. And then these last two, Adam, you wanted to add. Uh, there's uh, Jarnvida, the, the Ironwood yep. that we discussed last time. Which we are and... going to see very soon, Jarnvida. Yay! And... Uh, which is... <laughs> it's... And the other one, which doesn't have a name, but it's for, th before that one. No, it's three stanzas after Nida Vetlir and Orkolnir. Yeah. And it is yeah. just another place where there is a giantess sort of um that lives in the On woods and has lo lots of monstrous wolves mm -hmm, mm -hmm. uh in grimness right. which is an extremely old poem it's from the mid 900s yeah. it's one of our oldest and it's also explicitly that it is uh east of midgard which means it's not in midgard exactly um, 
And the, the last one is the realm is, that you suggested we add that doesn't have a name, but is uh, strongly implied to exist. Uh, the, I mean, I suggested a couple ones. The other one that does have a name I suggested is Gleisisvetlir, which is only oh. appears in late fun material, uh, like right, yeah, Bosa Saga. <laughs> Chat, how many people have heard of Bosa Saga? Yeah, Chad, <laughs> I'd love hands. to know how many... <laughs> <laughs> Oh, boy. Uh... Don't be shy. Exactly. Uh, yeah. It it is the ne next door kingdom to Jotunheimar. Of course. Uh -huh. My next guess. In yeah. In Bjarnaland. In northern Finland. Right. <laughs> sure. Exactly. <laughs> <Of course. laughs> oh boy. Exactly. Uh, no, this is not the one where Freya is Odin's consort. That is Sertlathauter. That is a completely yeah. different story. Ah, oh, Sertlathauter. Uh, uh, um, then there is also. Uh, the ocean question mark because yeah, Ayur, Ayur and Raun exist and Raun uh -huh. has her own hall according to Ervigya Saga and Ayur definitely has his own hall because it's in Hemiskviva. It's actually in several places. It's also in the Loka Senate. It's where exactly. they're having that party. It's all um, over the damn place but yeah. it's somewhere if you go east across Eligavaugar from there you end up at Hymir's hall in Jodenheim question mark. So, mm. Maybe Niflheim? Not clear. Uh, if, it's, if it's even real. <laughs> uh, but, is that its own place? We don't know. Uh, yeah. Other shoutouts to the Other random cow. underworld in Thorstein Saga Bayerwams. Of course. Which is, if you're going to pick Alfheim as a realm, that is how you do it, because it is a random, like, sub-world that you enter through spooky dead places and or oh. crossing spooky rivers. Uh, and that feels very right. And it's just this low-level underworld that persists all across underneath the real world. Um, so, you know, there's so many more places that feel like they could be realms. Mm -hmm, Not all of mm -hmm. them have names. I'm down for the theory about uh, Ayer and the Raun's realm being their own thing because... That actually makes sense. Uh, basically, Eider is like a cool guy. He hosts parties for the Eiser. He's uh, in the in the story where Tyr and Thor go and get a big cauldron to have more beer. It's for a party at Eider's place, and then that's where the cauldron is from then on. Uh, Raun gets all the people who die from drowning. That's her thing. Yeah. Uh, so she's she's spookier than her husband, you could say. Uh, but that means she has to have somewhere to put him. <laughs> so exactly. <sighs> and uh, well, she's she borrowing her under the rug. Exactly. <laughs> and according to Erebigia Saga, she sometimes lets them out so they can attend their own funeral, and then you'll have to sue the ghost to get them to leave and go back. <laughs> Quit. Uh, Quit. I... It wouldn't be an Icelandic saga without at least one legal battle. <laughs> <laughs> you're not dead if you're not legally dead. We can Ex bring you back. Ex yeah. Exactly. Uh, yeah, so basically, it's a mess. Uh, and there are so and many it options. the issue of trying to figure stuff out when you have literally like one source also because you have nothing competing with it to help you narrow down what anything is also there is another option for where i years hall is and it's a random ass <laughs> island north of denmark oh yes good because right. there's a ta there's an island called uh, uh norwegian lasso uh which is from old norse klesse and Klier, in multiple sources, most notably Augrip and the, uh, f Nor Norreys Fundith, I believe, uh, that says that there is a king in northern Finland whose name is Snyr, and his son, uh, is named Klier, except for one manuscript which says that his son is Ayr, and Ayr mm. founds a kingdom at Hesse, uh, or Claire founds a kingdom at Klesse, and if that's Ayr, then it's in the Cadigat. Just in between Norway oh, and Denmark. It's just there. Uh, okay. If you sail just the right way, you will find it. I mean, that does make sense. <laughs> like, people, I, I always think it's a losing battle to try and find a way to put the nine realms on a map because it's like you guys you really think they had a map when they were writing this right you think when they're like oh Serta comes for the from the south do you think that's because they had muspelheim on a map or because the south is where it gets hotter the anyway, south is where uh, it gets hotter a hundred percent yeah the north is where it gets colder the south is where it gets hotter i get it i live in the northern hemisphere too guys anyway <laughs> um, exactly uh god also 
uh, speaking of Neil Hooker, we saw the mention of Neil Hooker, uh, you know, living in Nephel and being yeah. annoying. And by the way, uh, there. Uh, yeah. Uh, she's down there somewhere. Um, and she's in need of your. Her, her, yeah. eating those she's down there. Just Karen, hanging out in the dark crags. They also have a uh, erasure of uh, Vidofnir and the eagle that Vidofnir sits on top of, and I am oh, upset yes, about the, it. Oh, yes, the, the eagle stack. <laughs> <laughs> the hawk That's sitting on top visual. of the eagle, and the eagle yeah. getting mad at Nidhogar and Ratatoskar trolling them both. Uh-huh, Excellent. Uh-huh. We love it, and they we erase that in that game, it. and instead make these just the Lindormer, uh, being the, the dragon stack. slipping down here. <laughs> Raptor stack, Raptor stack, I love it. Raptor stack, Raptor stack flows great and sounds like the name of like an indie band. <laughs> Raptor, Yo, stack. Raptor stack, we're Raptor stack. <laughs> oh, oh god, yeah. So this uh, has been my descent into madness for the last oh. couple days. So oh, yes, we are up to fifteen. No, uh, chat, chat counted for us. If we count all of my uh, spicy takes that don't necessarily have names or evidence for them, we're up to eighteen. <laughs> right, actually, yeah, chat me, uh, tell me how to spell those so I can add them to the list. I'll, I'll, I'll send them to you a message <laughs> afterwards. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> what a mess. Yeah. Yes. Also, chat's brought up Hilda a couple times, uh, which is like, hey, is that the reason why uh, all the elves are lawyers? And it's like, that's absolutely why. <laughs> it's an Icelandic saga thing. Yes. Um, or is it an episode of Hilda where they wrestle ghosts? They, the Icelandic uh, roots are very, very overt. Yes. Um, Listen, again, if you can beat a ghost in a legal battle, it can't kill you. That's the law. Yeah. Yeah. You really must. I don't okay. make the rules, I just enforce them with my <laughs> fists. Yes. Against you know, the I ghost. wonder if that's why Tolkien had the thing with like Bilbo comes back and has been declared legally dead and has to jump through all these hoops to get his stuff back. <laughs> the, no, the, that that feels much more like English inheritance law, but he got oh, bitten true. exactly <laughs> once by that and that was enough. <laughs> <laughs> he said never again. <laughs> I like the theory that they never officially declared Bilbo dead, just ever, after that. Yeah. It's They're like, like, he's well, only been gone 50 years. I'm yeah, sure he, he's fine. He, he <laughs> vanished at his birthday party, and then we heard later from, like, some like the friend of his, like, cousin, or his, like, nephew, that he sailed into the West, whatever that means, which means there's no... <laughs> There's no reason he went to, think... to California. Yeah. True. Well, there's no reason to think that fucker can't come back and then make us go through the paperwork again. So. Can you imagine exactly. Bilbo just coming back from the West and being like, "I'm here. I saw you touched my spoons." Yeah. <laughs> so help me, Lobelia. Yeah. Anyway. Oh, oh boy. Careful. We Gosh. do have some good Thank questions you. in chat while they are stuck in cutscene land. By the way. Uh, yay! Excellent. Yay! So how similar are the Norse gods to the Germanic ones? Uh, Lynn, you have archaeological yeah. training that is vaguely relevant, namely how uh, bonkers I different... I really don't. <laughs> you've I done, really you've, don't. You've done Bronze Age and how bonkers oh, different yeah. Bronze Age and Iron Age archaeology are. <laughs> yeah, kind of. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Make something I mean, up, I believe in you. Theoretically, the whole region Where is just are? kind of connected and everybody shuffles deities back and forth and i mean we have like the same yes. general kind of, of like naming the days after the gods like that's not too different even in like modern uh, I'm not offended. german yeah. like it's, just a word. it's roman it's norse it's all a mess because human culture transcends borders very easily <laughs> yep <laughs> through marriage, through war, through trade, whatever you like, things get shuffled around real quick, real easy. And it helps that, like, all those areas are incredibly polytheistic and we're quite open to just sort of, like, adding new attributes to gods that they already had. Like, just because they can, because they like that this one makes Odin a little bit spicier. Yep. That's cool. <laughs> uh, but if I, remember, if I remember Drug my vague... Punch, all that cool shit. But what is Loki going to uh, if I remember my vague archaeology correctly, like, we start off... We really start getting, like, depictions of things we recognize as the Norse gods in, like, the 8th century? And then there's, like, yeah, fucking nothing before that? <laughs> There's, like, stuff, I feel like, is usually, like, more of what hits, like, the archaeological record, like, depictions of things, like, the sun imagery and everything like that, which, like, might be linked to, like, the not very sunny summer of, what was it, 536? 536! Hashtag, thank you, Neil Price. 
I was gonna say you did your you did you stuff on yeah. that, uh, right? Neil, Neil Price is the one who co-authored the article proposing that with Clive Oppenheimer, who is also very chill. I also think that that's a completely ridiculous argument, but uh, you know, basically says, hey, there's a weird cold snap, and three years feels significant, and ignores any mm -hmm. interpretations of three being an important number for any other reason. <laughs> for many, many different cultures. Yeah, I think that three, three is just iterations of three. Three is like, it's the smallest number of things that's more than two. Exactly. And, and great like math, that. yes. Yeah. Yeah. This is Red's <laughs> math degree like, coming in, folks. <laughs> Quick maths over here in the archaeology department. Oh, also, sorry, uh, oh, the cutscene land has had some interesting things happening. Uh, Don't worry. I like how Kratos, like, skimmed yeah, past right. the orbit of being a good dad and then accidentally oh, slingshot it off in the other direction of being a bad one by being like, you are my son and nothing more. And it's like, no, Kratos, no, freeze that any other way. True. <laughs> he said, I helped make you, I decide what you are. <laughs> yeah. And no, son, there is no magical prophecy of your destiny. You're just my boy. <laughs> my boy. <laughs> just my son. <laughs> my boy. Yep. My boy. I've abandoned my boy. <laughs> <laughs> Emotionally neglected my boy. Mm. True. Uh, by the way, also drink water, uh, everyone. Everyone in chat and on camera, we had a hail hydrate, therefore okay. drink water, take care of yourself. Excellent. I don't have any water. <laughs> I have tea, uh, but... Yeah, I've also got tea, had too. Tea. Water in this tea. Oh, good. I we are... the boba out of the bottom of my boba tea. Amazing. Mm. Oh, I by the way, also, um, this world just got real spooky real fast. Uh, real spooky real fast? That's Ooh. not his bed where he laid down to go take a nap. Is Atreus having a highly symbolic dream sequence? These are my favorite plot device because you can do literally anything in them. They guess, are so useful. Guess what? Uh, three, two, one. Uh, highly symbolic, highly symbolic device. Let's go. Yeah, baby. We are my favorite footnote ever written. This was revealed to me in a dream. Yes. <laughs> Also, random ass, like, mask that I'm sure we have never seen mask? before in our lives and will never be important again. I was gonna say, I'm sure that doesn't matter for plot. <laughs> nah. Also, nah, flashbacks to the previous- sand version of little boy it's wonder himself? True. Yeah. Yes. Over over oh no, there's two of them. This is getting oh, out no. of hand. <laughs> <Same old problem. laughs> We're sick of hearing ah. about little They're hiding in the sand. Ah. 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 <laughs> oh, no. And not nice ones. You broke the game. Atreus just casually finding out through 23 and B that he has a whole other want? half of the family that he never knew about. <laughs> True. Oh boy. I don't understand. There's so many of them. There sure are. There's one for every time Kratos says Whatever. boy in the last game. Oh, God. <laughs> the game's gonna crash. Don't run off. Boy, boy, boy. Can you tell me where I am? Listen, I'm just like, boy. I would love to see that just montage together with no context, just every boy in God of War 4. <laughs> like 45 minutes long. Boy. Boy, boy, boy. boy. <laughs> and we love character development. Now he only calls him my son. Exactly. Son. And nothing else. And nothing oh. more. You're, You're not good, special. Uh, oh, good. there he goes. I gotta get out of here. Those are some suspicious pillars, aren't they? We love wait pillars. a fucking minute. Suspicious <laughs> desert temple, wait. Hey, hey, that's that's Romanesque. What's going <laughs> Don't on? Don't worry about it. It's, Don't worry about it. It's not even Romanesque. It's like, it's like it's chunky, like Tolkien Art Deco. Don't worry about it. Well, some of them are policy and marbly, so. <laughs> I do like that Atreus doesn't know shit about Spartan stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Small. Kratos is like, Kratos did the standard, like, immigrant dad thing of, like, I want to give you an opportunity in this new world, so I won't oh tell God. you anything about your cultural heritage. <laughs> and now Atreus is like, wait, what? Who am I? <laughs> Please. You say I'm Please your wait. son, but I can't even Please. speak Greek. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> How are we going to talk shit about people if we can't speak Greek? Uh. Papa. It's always rough when you get stabbed by a symbolic representation of your younger self who, in yeah. his dickhead Stop. phase that lasted about five minutes total. Exactly. Could you imagine getting absolutely ratioed by like the nine-year-old version of yourself, though? <laughs> <laughs> 
I'd be done. I'm packing it. I'd go home. L plus ratio plus stabbed in the neck. Oh, boy. No, he's fine now. It's, it's a dream stabbing. This is why dream sequences are great. You can do whatever you want, and there's no consequences except character development. We love to see it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And now we're somewhere completely different. Exactly. Now we are awake and somewhere completely different. Yay. Yay. This looks like Scandinavia, and <laughs> definitely not underwater, but Under above the water. <laughs> Puppy! Puppy! No, wait, sorry. It's a bear with mange. Hey, where are you going? You'll love to see it. Yeah. Follow you? We have That's a one bear with mange. Now. Okay, I'm sorry for making major running joke in your chat, side. by the way. No, that, this is this sounds correct. Okay. <laughs> uh, We're all just academics with mange. So my theory is that you're physically in this location now. Like yes. you, you were dreaming, and now you've just like you, you, you teleported. I can't you accidentally confirm. teleported. Really? Uh, Wait, I'm right. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> There's now a second puppy. <gasps> Excellent. So. Okay. So which of them we is just found the, the spawn point? Yeah. <laughs> There's a third puppy. Uh, yes, yes. <laughs> puppy <laughs> pile. <laughs> Is this Ironwood? Little fluffy baby yeah, boys. Yeah, Is there one up there? I dreamt oh, so here. so Atreus knows he's awake I mean, now. Okay, oh, yeah. fine. Sure. I yep. Have. I'm here. Kratos uh, gonna be mad. This is why you let your kid have a cell phone, Kratos. <laughs> True. <laughs> Dad, can you come pick me up? There's like wolves. <laughs> What's that? Here's a question. Do you think you would have oh, Wi-Fi service across the different realms? Hmm. Good question. Or do you need, sure like, you. a different SIM card? There's another puppy. <laughs> oh, God. I mean, knowing God of War, there'd be a whole, like, hour-long side quest to get the correct SIM card. Uh, to get that sweet, sweet international SIM card. Exactly. <laughs> Instead of that, like, Kratos is just texting you, like, boy, the charges for international calling between <laughs> realms <laughs> through the roof. Five Did you just text puppies. me some need of that? <laughs> How dare you? Smell. You know we don't have a plan for that. <laughs> I don't know. Is that six yeah. puppies? This is why we keep our, plane, uh, our phones in Bifrost mode when we travel. <laughs> <laughs> Seven, eight uh, puppies. Eight whole eight puppies. Whole puppies. Wow. Me you're eat me. Excellent. <laughs> this is great. I love everything about this. That's it's perfect. Uh, there right. is a question, by the way, because uh, we're going to have cutscenes for a bit. There was a question uh, uh, somewhere under the puppies uh, from Gilsbit. Question for you, uh, Lynn. Are you familiar oh. with and do you have opinions on BJ581? <laughs> What? I don't know her. I've never really? met her in my life. Is that a manuscript? No, nope, the uh, warrior woman burial. Birka. Oh, the I've one where everyone's warrior, like, it's but... a female warrior, but then everyone's like, mm, maybe not. And then um, we were well, like, but we maybe yes. Are we seriously trying to gender skeletons again? I thought we sure knew are. this was a losing sure battle. Are. Like, it would be cool if she's a lady warrior. warrior, but there are a ton of explanations for why a skeleton looks like right. that. I, I, oh I no no this was we... this was this was genetic analysis. There is surviving genetic material that is XX chromosomal. That is very cool, <laughs> but still, the way that hormones manifest can be very weird for a lot of different True. reasons. Uh, but still, True. very cool. That is extremely cool. Um, but also, like I, I mentioned before we started streaming that I at one point had like a forensic. Uh, anthropology or just a forensics class uh and when we were talking about gendering skeletons it's like each individual part of a skeleton generally gets like gendered on a scale of one to five and it's like there, there are specific traits sure where it's yet. like this is most <gasps> commonly found in right. uh xx versus xy for the most part uh and there was even an exercise in class where it was like all right i want you to feel your own skull and uh check the specific details of like these and like what like if it was just your skull how would you probably be gendered by you know and uh <laughs> anthropologist or your phrenology on yeah. yourself well, I mean, it, was, it was just for the, the sake of like yeah. there's a reason why whenever these whenever a skeleton is gendered it's like most likely this most likely that and it's like it's not trying to be pc they genuinely don't know yep um, right um, I mean, that's like anyway. a big problem with archaeology in general is like yeah. the, the older and like the further back you get, you're going to find like bits. Bits. Mm -hmm. And like there's good chances that like unless you're finding like a pelvis or a femur that you're probably not going to be able to like 
gender the skeleton at all. Like, if you, you find, like, a toe bone, what are you supposed to do yeah, with that? <laughs> even then, even when you have the pelvis, it's not right. a guarantee. Exactly. It could just be, like, a man with a wide flared pelvis. You wouldn't yeah. know. Or a woman with a narrow one. They do right. exist. Uh, they do and exist. Like, They're out there. Yeah, and it's like, it's like, if you don't have the Dude. skull and the pelvis, you got Weird no chance. If you have no. them, you have, like, you oh. can guess, but that's all right. it ever is. It's just educated guesses. And of course it also varies based on ethnicity, but this is a kind of thing where the people who were like laying down the, the typifying for this were in the 1800s and racist. So it's like, yep. good, good yep. fucking luck. Yep. Anyway, uh, Angra Boda looks really cool. Anyway, the, uh, yeah, I, because I have other good transitions, right? You know what else is really hard to determine from a smidge of bone? Ethnicity. Yeah. Yes, yes, absolutely. <laughs> And I, I think one of the big problems is that, like, we just don't have as much data as we would Let's like. Because mm -hmm. you're just never going to find every single person that was buried. Like, statistically, no. like, the majority of people who were buried were buried in a way where they just decompose. Or, like, animals oh. and worms, like, get at your bones and your bones you just, like, turn know. back to dust and everything. And we're just never going to know well, so. where they were. And then, like, there's, like periods of time where like inhumation wasn't even like a thing that they were doing they were just straight up cremating people like said, and yeah, they put you in an urn and they put that urn in the ground and they didn't bury right. you with like anything Not and like you just cannot no. tell status or ethnicity one. or gender from a pile of ash no. like you just yeah. cannot <laughs> Not have that the, the information isn't there that's the hardest thing about any sort there. of historical research is like a lot of information is lost. Once yep. it's lost, you can't get it back. Everything you do is like, it's extrapolation or just storytelling. Um, so and the fact that like archeology span in general is just like a destructive science. Once you dig yeah. that person up, <laughs> you cannot undig them. Any yeah. evidence that you didn't collect the first time around, you probably destroyed in the process. Like no matter how careful like, you are, yeah. you've now just like completely changed the stratigraphy of like where you were so like where digging exactly? and everything. And like sites are like revisited and like new things are found, but like you don't usually dig up the same hole twice. Nope. <laughs> nope. <laughs> and I, I think it's just like it, it to go back to like that burial of like the female warrior. I think the problem again is just like not having enough I thought Iron information because it could very well be possible that there were Literally other sites like that and they just weren't like yeah. kept preserved that way like people either knew where they were because like this happened with like the mummies in egypt all the time right usually the people who were building the tombs came back two days later and looted the place <laughs> because they knew how they had built the whole structure they knew where everything was and it's free and cheap easy money like if you know that like Ilsa was buried with like a sweet sword and like a bunch of like brooches and you're like I would like a sweet sword like yeah, you know would. where they put her in the ground dig her up that's a free sword and mm -hmm. then you just like shovel it back over again if you don't do it well something's gonna get at the bones and then you're not gonna have like that sight anymore like we just don't know sweet. how many different types of burial there are because like they just don't survive. Yeah. Yeah, Speaking the of free brooches, though, by the way. Yeah, this is a giant coat clasp, isn't it? That's this, is, this, sure is a, is. this is a pin brooch. We love a brooch. Gorgeous. I love it when they let the giants actually be giant. All that, ooh, we yes. don't know if the giants were giants. Like, the word giant is in the fucking name. They were big. <laughs> if, One of them got so, turned into a planet. Do here? <laughs> don't worry about it. <laughs> exactly. If we're uh, using the word Yotnar, it gets messy and spicy. But if we're using the word sure If we're using the word giant, they're giant. The... Yeah, yeah that makes a the... really good question because, like, you're completely right. Like, Emir was turned into the world. His eyebrows got turned into the world. The rest of it was used for other shit. <laughs> His anyway. skull is the sky. But, like, it, it does make a good question because then, like, in other cases, you have, like, giants in terms of, like, Jotnar who are obviously, like, biologically compatible with, like, Aesir. And so yeah, it's like, also... are, like, is this the same? Like, is it different? Like, it is What's interesting. The they kind of, they also draw the distinction, uh, like giant's daughters and uh, dwarf daughters aren't yeah. necessarily yeah. the same as giants and dwarves. Anyway, it's it's all a, a huge thing. But um, but also, the, the thing about the the female burial is really interesting because it's like I think the only reason people are making a big deal out of this is because this narrative. Uh, the you same narrative we were talking about before about how like 18th century English gender roles must be rooted in yeah. like 60,000 years of Paleolithic history. And the idea that like there was a lady who kicked ass and was buried as a warrior is like, you, it, it, this has to be like, 
there are two sides of this, and they both absolutely need a concrete answer for what the situation of this burial was, because one of them wants to say, you see, this has always been a thing, and the other one wants to say, no, this was never a thing, you're wrong about this, the burial means something else. Uh, and the only reason this is getting so much focus is because that argument is still happening, when in actuality, again, you know, the whole people have always been people thing, they're people... There have always been people who will follow their own path in Can't life, whatever their right, social you know. and cultural norms are. And um, it's like uh, it's like that little that little girl in, I want to say, ancient Rome, who was buried in an athlete's casket that was modified to be co-ed. Uh, oh, interesting. Yeah, uh, she, she died at like six and her parents got like a like a little marble casket that was carved with um, with father. scenes of youths uh, doing you know sports together and someone kind of went in and, and changed it so that there were uh, young boys and girls both in the, and oh. it's like, okay, people have all, you've always had, you know, yeah. sporty kids and you've always had, you know, it, the world has not just been a monolith of terribleness that will, you know, mash down right. individuality. So, like, we, we can't know what the cultural and social norms were for civilizations that are so far gone that we don't know anything about them anymore. And we can read some of that out of their burial practices, but at the same time, when people are like, if we find, like, the one specific example that, that proves the rule, it's like, that's never been how history has worked. No. You can look at any period in history... <laughs> And you can find, like, you'll, you'll find happy people and you'll find people carving their own paths and, and de defying whatever norms of society didn't work for them. You will always be able to find those people. And sometimes they were buried according to the way they lived. And that's all you can get from that. Yep. I think it's just, like, totally. because it coincides so neatly with, like, the current, like, feminist movement that people really right. sort of point to it as, like, look at that, it's a kick-ass woman who fought, like, a warrior. Boss. Exactly! Yeah. The original I... girl boss. She's gatekeeping, she's yeah. gaslighting, we love her. <laughs> uh... you know, you know, it's like the, the idea that you your, your social movement only has merit if you can point to a right. period in history when it was the dominant idea is, like, there doesn't need to be a precedent. You can just do your own thing. It, even if people were correct about how the yeah, woman's uh, place has always been lesser, like, you can right. still be an ass kicker. You can still yeah. break the rules. Like, you, you don't need somebody to tell you it's okay. Anyway. Yeah. Yep. yeah. I think people I also like it because it's like, for whatever reason, I feel like people point to the Vikings a lot for being like, they were really like pro feminist as like a culture. Like, there's like women this... could own property and did math. Right. Wow. And there's like shield maidens and like the literature. Okay. And it's like, yes, but guy. also shield maidens exist within a very like specific this. context that's still uh, like heavily sorry. sort of like really framework by the patriarchy. Yeah. Also, yeah. Like, the they're idea essentially that, uh... just like the cup bearers in Valhalla. Like, they exist to serve the people who like went to Valhalla. Yeah. And, like, they don't select the people who go there like odin sends like yeah. the valkyries Everything's to like go okay, right? and pick them yeah. up like they're essentially just like messengers if you read like the deeper exists. lore and there's like examples in no. sagas where it's like women who fight but yeah. then it's like as soon as they become like of childbearing age they always yeah. get married they always have kids and then the line is always like they put down their shield, they put down their sword, and they became a mother. Like, yeah, those narratives yeah. only exist within a very specific framework. And I think people like to forget that and be like, oh, look, like, women who fight, like, crazy cool, like, Valkyries who, like, bring the dead to, like, Valhalla for Odin. Yeah. And it's like... <laughs> there's, there's, it's a cool image. There's some Sorry. complexity in there. Uh, yeah. Because, right, Valkyria is a slain chooser. And there's... Yeah. But, all yeah, the most the famous slain. all the most famous Valkyries are the ones who said, Fuck you, I'm choosing someone different. Uh, yeah. and then mm -hmm. get punished for it. But right, there is that cognizance that they do have in this agency that can kind of uh defy that role, and then they get punished for it very hard, but there's always a they consequence have to that. it. Yeah. Yeah. And then there's also the Mei Konungar who are or the Mei Konungur who is yes. different. Yeah. Also, the idea that, like, uh, having powerful, like, goddesses and uh, female spirits in a mythology automatically means the culture was feminist is, like, Whoa. you remember Whoa. Athena, right? <laughs> um, Athena and Artemis and all that jazz, like, there were some kick-ass Greek goddesses and they were all very cool, but that didn't mean the Greek culture was good about right. that shit. It didn't mean they were like, right. all women are like Artemis and Athena. It meant they were like, yeah, those are the those are the cool goddesses. Like, Athena's our patron spirit, but she also doesn't literally tell us what to do, so, you know, it's right. fine. 
<sighs> like all it proves is that like they looked around and were like, wow, women exist. I guess yeah. our pantheon will reflect our culture, which includes women. <laughs> I really do think that so much of this just boils down to like, I want there to be historical precedent for the world that I wish I lived in. Yeah. Which, which is again, it's like, you, you know, people don't want to just be like, I'm going to do this thing. They want their, they want it to be okay to do the thing. And the way that that interp the way that that manifests is like, I need to have seen someone do it before. And the thing is, I think this is a very real thing because this is the entire representation in media argument. And there's something really there. If you spend your whole life only ever seeing people who aren't like you yeah. doing things or like the only context you see people like you in is that they're useless or sidelined or or lesser that does hurt yeah. you know that that damages i think that again ties into like humans are so social that the way we see other people act is the way that we learn the world works yeah. uh yeah. and there, there's a reason why people want this but i think that they don't they don't need it they don't need to be shown that historically speaking, things were different and perhaps better or did this thing that they wanted, you know, you can still just make the world different. Uh, yeah. But I understand why they so strongly it. want when. it to have been this way. Yeah. No, I mean, absolutely, no. because it's easier to point and be like, look, there's proof that like what I'm doing is correct because someone else has done it before and that sets precedent. It's just like, I think things get twisted a lot yeah. and people try to fit like the past into modern ideologies, which like, doesn't work in any sort of neat or like really like good way a lot of the time because you no, can't really yeah. like shoehorn the past into the present because nothing ever happens the same way twice like even yeah. if you did the past over entirely and you made all of like the same decisions it's not gonna wash out yeah. the same and to sort of try to like use yeah. that as like proof and precedent isn't gonna work <laughs> there's a concept in museum studies and cultural heritage of like a useful past and the idea that you know people mm. go to museums uh and broader i think historical media because the past is useful in some way for various group this? identities uh oh, sure for good and for ill right it's useful what you use it for is up to you Hang on. uh okay, yeah. i think no, that's something that's very true in this discussion is that you know you it's a completely normal instinct that you sh are that you want this past to be Whoa. usable and part of that yeah. means that it represents you and what <laughs> like that's not a distortion or that's not necessarily a distortion of history i don't think that's something that we should be like this is bad we don't need it we shouldn't take these arguments seriously because the argument that it's like presentist or otherwise, uh, I don't know. Do, yeah, doing I mean, something I... goofy, uh, some goofy thing that will make an old white guy angry. Like that's not, <laughs> that's not a counterpoint. It's just, it's what's actually usable. Uh, and how do we make sure that the Whoa, uses people have are those that reflect historical evidence uh yeah and that are i think there's a good distinction to be made between like learning from the past and like understanding sort of trends that lead in certain directions versus trying to like base everything off of the past and try to like find truth for the present yeah in the past yeah. because i definitely think 100%. there's like trends and things that you can see like in the past where it's like oh like once you start singling out like a single ethnic group and blaming like all your societal problems on them it's probably <laughs> not gonna go in a good direction nah, from there so um just versus trying to just like nah, be like just look <laughs> there's like proof for everything uh, that's happening like right now in the past and we should only look to like the past to understand the present and like build the future yeah, yeah. It's, I mean, it's a very, very weird space. Uh, and I think as, you know, as the world has gotten a lot more interconnected and it's become a lot easier for people to just get information that they just, you know, wouldn't have been able to find earlier. There's been sort of like a fandomification of various forms of history and mythology, which I've certainly contributed to. <laughs> um, but like, I, I think that it's, it's sort of a double-edged sword because on the one hand, it can be surprising how modern a lot of historical things are. Yeah. Um, but on the other hand, you know, the modern world does not need to follow the past, right. you know, th new things 
can and should happen. You know, we're, li we're living at a time of unprecedented human con connection because technological yeah. advancements that have never been done before have happened in the last 150 years. And that's, that's good. That's fine. But like, you know, th there, there's no text written before 1900 that has any idea what the future that we're living yeah. in is going to look like. Uh, and I, I've been thinking about this a lot because I started noticing uh, in, in literature written since about 2005, uh, mm -hmm. there's been an interesting shift in the way characters being able to communicate with each other has happened. And it happens because now almost everyone in the world has a cell phone. Uh, mm -hmm. And if you don't have a cell phone, you have a computer yeah. or some other way to instantaneously communicate with anyone else in the world as long as you know who they are and what their number or you know phone is or whatever. Oh, no. And what I noticed is that in that pretty much all fiction written before like 2000, from. the general assumed state there of things is that the characters are isolated. There? If they're not in the same room as each other, they gotta send letters or phone calls or telegrams or you know some kind of distant communication. But, you know, they're not always chatting at each other. There no magic Bluetooth earpieces. Nobody's in anyone else's ear. Uh, and then around 2005, that starts shifting. And you start getting magic Bluetooth earpieces. But you also start getting in, like, fantasy settings, people using, like, magic or psychic powers to be like, let's just, let's just hug, like, hook up our minds so that we can always be chatting. You know, let's, or let's, let's use a spell so we can just talk. Um, and these tools in these fictional universes existed the whole time. But right. they weren't used for this until our culture shifted subtly the way we think about each other. We just, you know, mid-1900 sci-fi writers did not envision a world like the one we live in now. Uh, they, they couldn't have because the knockdown world-building consequences of cell phones becoming cheap and available and, yeah. and technology becoming miniaturized to that point, that's almost impossible to predict, but it did happen. And now writers who didn't think about it this way are thinking about it this way now. It, it, if you go looking, like, most, even, like, fantasy settings will be, like, like Castlevania is mostly pseudo-historical with Wait, vampires, and then in season two, they're like, also, we have magic mirrors like so we can instantaneously again. communicate across any distance with video. Don't worry about it. And it's like, okay, times, sure, fine. Uh, there's, like, iPads and she there's, uh, there's, like, four different kinds of smartphone in the Owl yeah. House. It's just... It, it, okay. It's easier now. It's easier for yeah. writers to write characters that think the way we do, and that includes Ready? the idea that communication yeah. is the constant state right. of being, and being out of communication is unusual and cause for alarm. Yes. Yeah. Um, and that's the kind of invisible shift that most people haven't noticed. You can kind of tell the writers are like surprising themselves, like, why didn't I think of this sooner? The characters can just always know where they are unless something's yeah. wrong. And it's like, yeah, you didn't think well, of it sooner. Because before 2005, it was pure fantasy it to was be pure connected fantasy. in that way. Yeah, exactly. It's really interesting. And that's the, kind of, that, that's the kind of like subtle shift in the way that people think that happens when technology and settings and environment changes you know we, we change to adapt so smoothly we don't even notice but at the same time we want to look into the distant past and see ourselves and it's like the paradigm we're operating under is so different that like we can find parallels to certain things but at the same time like the differences between us and these people of the past are on the one hand superfluous and circumstantial but on the other hand so foundational to the way they thought yeah. and saw their world that they can't be ignored but they are no. practically invisible no. to us so yeah. that's i think the hardest part of all of this it's not right no i completely agree and i think it goes back that to what we were talking what about happened. earlier with sort of like the idea of like what they were doing wasn't for us mm, because their yeah. way of thinking like their entire framework of like seeing the world was so fundamentally different because that's existing in a world where there real. is no real. type of long distance communication. Yeah. That just doesn't even exist. That's not even like a thing that people have conceived of yet. Like communication exists within the people that you know, which is going to be like 20, 30, maybe 50 people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And whatever like your little family group is. And like maybe if there's like other groups like near you, there's yeah. communication there. And even that's like a question of like, are your dialects even going to match up in any, like, meaningful way that you can even, like, properly communicate? Or is it just, like, every family group has its own dialect and no one can really, like, understand each other? Which probably isn't true because, again, we managed to, like, procreate with, like, a different species who we yeah. don't even know, like, was capable of speech in, like, the same way that we are. So obviously there's, like, and there's ways of communicating even across, like, languages when neither of you, like, speak okay. anything. Like, you can use hand signals. Yeah, to get like exactly. your most basic needs across like that exists and i think that goes back to just like again that like deep-seated desire to like 
communicate and to sort of just like connect mm -hmm. with other people which i feel like is sort of the problem with like trying to shoehorn the past into the present is like we're trying so hard to connect with like what's happened before us because we see time as like a one-way path, right? Like, we don't know what the future looks like, but we've seen the past. The past has happened. And yeah. even if you haven't, like, lived it, like, you either know people, like, your grandparents who, like, lived it before you, or you have, like, books. Like, you have bits and pieces that, like, prove to you that, like, the past happened and this is what it looked like, even though that's not entirely true because, like, you're just getting one person snapshot of like any one moment without any sort of real like context to like what's happening anywhere else. Um, but it's easier to connect to the past that way because we know what it looks like and we know what's happening. We know sort of like what lessons we can pull from that yeah. while the future is just kind of like a big question mark. Yeah, definitely. I think there, there's definitely a comfort in seeing a story from the from beginning to end. And yeah. when you're looking in history, it's like, well, I know how this ends, you know, and I can see the whole thing. Uh, and then trying to use that to extrapolate, like, yeah. I I don't want to make any sort of sweeping statements about, like, the, the history, you know, the study of history is an attempt to predict the future. And it's like, that's not the only thing that's going on there. <laughs> but I do think it is a thing that's going on with some yeah. of them. You're like, you know, it, people love, you know, the, the rise and fall of empires. They love seeing cycles of history. They don't love living them, but, you know, they... No. I, th I think it lends security is yeah. like if you can it, it helps you predict the uncertain because again like we don't see the future and yeah. that's terrifying like you can predict what will happen tomorrow that like you'll go and get groceries or whatever but like maybe you get hit by an asteroid in the middle of the night like you just <laughs> don't know what's yeah. going to even like one second from now like you don't know what's going to happen and so yeah. i think we draw on the past a lot as sort of like a security blanket because we can see those trends again like those big sweeping things that have happened and we can try to apply them to the future and i think sometimes yeah. we try too hard <laughs> hashtag biometric yeah. moment <laughs> yeah there's an I entire also... field it's no less accurate than you psychos <laughs> yeah. you right i oh man i as you were saying that something occurred to me uh mm. i almost wonder if part of the reason why everything was kind of like <laughs> fucked in the 40s through 70s was in part knockdown effects of like cold war and nuclear research and mm -hmm. the general awareness that like oh we've actually done something that has never been done before yeah. and the scale in which we are impacting the world is beyond our comprehension like it's it's kind of the same discussion that's like the same change that's happened in the discussion of global warming um mm -hmm. because like when i was you know like a kid and people were still like using al gore as a punchline it was like it's ridiculous to believe that we could ever affect the world on that scale the world's so big and that was also when like the hole in the ozone layer hit the news and everyone was sort of like oh <laughs> Wait a minute, hold on. We've we been at this, that. <laughs> we've been this for a while, actually. This might be bad. And like the sort of shift, again, it's, it's an invisible shift, like going from communication is a rare uh, thing nice to, to communication you. is a constant thing. It, the shift from, it would be absurd and hubristic to believe oh, that wow. we could actually affect yeah. the entire world to, girl. not huh. only can we definitely affect the entire world, we can make it better. We can like genuinely fix the things we fucked up and like yeah. help things not be a problem. Like that was a quiet shift that took about a decade and a half before everyone was like, Come on up. Yeah, I mean, we're pretty much on board with that. Like, the, the, most of the, the the base of like like climate denial has gone from like the mainstream opinion to most people who are still weird, weird about it are just doomers about it now. They're just like, well, there's absolutely yeah. nothing we can do, so there's no point. It's like, okay, so now you do think it's happening. I see. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I see how it is. Um, anyway, but like, just the idea that like the that we've actually done something on a scale that no culture before so, um, us has done. Like, yeah, we've kind of just accepted that. I think once the population the crossed no one billion, there was a little yeah. bit of like, oh no, that's so scary, that's so <laughs> many people. Like, if you read, like, mid 1900s sci-fi, no. they'll be like, yeah. the, world, the world population is so, eight billion. Everything so, is yeah. fucked. There's no <laughs> space left. And it's like, oh yeah, that's- <laughs> Me that's, in 2022 just... reading this, like, oh. Yeah. That's just awful, wow. So, I guess we gotta soil and green it up. Going. There's no other way. Like, <laughs> we just, you know, they couldn't the river, conceive of it find. because they hadn't lived yeah. it. But once we lived it enough, it's like, okay, that's just how things are now. And we adapt. Yeah. We're really good at adapting. We got that good neuroplasticity. Yeah. But it's just like, you know, we, they're, it's scary to do something yeah. for the first time and realize that there is no, there's no safety net. There's no historical precedent. 
this has never happened before and it's never been okay afterwards. Uh, yeah. And I think part of the reason why everyone in the Cold War was like genuinely working under the assumption that the world was going to end in like five years tops. Uh, I think that explains some of the Those fuckedness of uh, <laughs> the latter right. half of the 19th century. Okay. Um, I mean, it's, it, it <laughs> no, is really interesting to think about it though, because I know, really like, cute. specifically for Denmark, the they had, like, a lot of issues, specifically home. during World War II, like where, like, they were happens. occupied for, like, a large portion of the war, because, like, Denmark yeah. is Germany's hat, and so they were like, we'll just take that. Um, <laughs> but the Danes, like, particularly the government, like, cooperated a lot Ooh. with the Nazi party. And they did it, I can understand why they did it, because they wanted to keep their monarchy and they wanted to, like, be able to, like, maintain kind of, like, control over the country. And so they kind of agreed on this, like, tacit cooperation with Nazi Germany to, like, not be fully like right. overrun and like fully controlled by like the Nazi party. But like, it's a big debate now about whether that was like too much cooperation with like an occupying power, like particularly under fascism. Uh, but after, yeah. yeah, it's like to this day, people are like, mm, maybe we shouldn't have done that. Cause like now Denmark can't just really stand there. Like we were victims. Like you did actively cooperate. That is, yeah, that, like that's a fascist hard. regime. And they only did it for, I think, like about two years. And then from like, I want to say like 46 or 47 onward, like they did become like fully occupied mm -hmm. um, until like the wow. end of the that's war. Bad. And it was partly because like there was like a huge resistance movement, like against the Nazis and everything from like the regular Danish people. And they smuggled so like all the Jews out of Copenhagen, yes. I think, in like one night. And like move them all to Sweden. Like I think they managed to move like seven hundred something people Seems over. Like work, um, in the middle of the night, people just like hid them in their houses and then like got them down to like the harbor. But after the war ended, Denmark was really having like a crisis of identity. Oh, because they yeah, were like, who it? are we? Like it we cooperated like with like the Nazis. Like yeah. and this was <laughs> yeah. like after like all obviously of like the atrocities that like Nazi Germany had committed were like coming out because like a lot of that wasn't entirely clear until like the end of the war because like communication right. like there w and nobody was like from the outset able to get into like the concentration camps to see what was actually going on there until they started liberating the camps but so denmark was like who are we anymore like what do we do yeah like, they were somewhat like financially devastated from this obviously like socially devastated and then in the early 50s like 1950 and 1952 is when they start digging up like the bog bodies Oh, and it gets really friends. complicated, like more, with though. the narrative around the bog bodies, because they sort of adopted the bog <laughs> bodies go. as like this new national narrative, particularly mm. because of the guy who dug them up. It was a guy named PV Glob, who was a Danish archaeologist. <laughs> I'm How many more sorry, my boy Glob, <laughs> my baby boy. <laughs> PV Glob, I'm PV sure he's Glob. lovely. Unless he's I was, lovely. I was waiting for the where we were going with this. <laughs> it's the bug bodies. PV Glob, he's if you look up pictures of him, he is the coolest looking dude. He's like out there in like his little like Lopa Pesa, standing in the bog with like his tripod, his camera. We love him. I, um, I gotta figure out how the fuck to spell this. <laughs> uh, I just PV, because I think it's. Yeah. Peter Wilhelm or something oh, in a G L O B. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Yeah, look at him. Look at his little Wikipedia picture. He's got his pipe, he's got his tripod, he's like knees deep in the bog. I wanna be this man. He I got it. extremely cool. <laughs> we're we're showing we're showing chat. Uh hold up just a sec. Yes, please show chat, my beautiful baby man. Uh, Love of my life. Uh, <laughs> that button. Show, show the boys and what? girls. Oh. Uh that. <laughs> I just, I think I just lost him. No! No, he's, he's there. Boy. Is he still he's there? there? He yeah. is. Yeah, he was there for him. a minute. He was there for a second, oh, he's back now. I clicked, is, I put is, him yeah. into a different Excellent. window. There he is, my handsome boy. <laughs> um, But yeah, so he basically wrote a book called Mosefolket, which is bog people, or like oh, the people yeah. of the bog. Mm -hmm. And it became incredibly popular, not just in Denmark, like everywhere, like the new revised edition has like a copy of a letter that like a bunch of like English schoolgirls wrote him where they were like, we love your book, it's so cute, we love him. Aww. He basically wrote really too. romantically 
about bog bodies like uh. almost in like a poetic kind of sense and he really huh. tied bog bodies into kind of like danish national heritage and he mm. cites tacitus a lot which is a oh, problem no. well he didn't um, know he didn't know he i mean he should have known it was 1950 <laughs> like he probably oh. should have done like yeah a little bit more research but like there really wasn't any information on bog bodies at that point because oh. that's when they started wait being found was like the mid 1800s to like present because when you bury someone a bog eventually becomes like a peat (laughs) bog so like the water eventually drains out of it and all of that like condensed plant material becomes peat um p-e-a-t in case anyone's wondering not p-e-e-t like a little cat's foot Um, (laughs) but people harvest peat for fuel because it burns really really well and Uh. 1850 and onwards was sort of like around the time that like everyone who's been like digging up their peat got to like the same level down in the bog where like it matches up with like that's the iron age and like the bronze age is underneath it and so all of a sudden people were just like digging people out of like bogs everywhere (laughs) you're like what's going on (laughs) and so 1950 i think they found tolland man in the 1952 they found kolbeleman um and pv glob wasn't able to excavate tolland man but he had heard about it in tolland man unfortunately they the only part that they preserved of him was his head they just like threw his body away and they like took his head to the national museum in copenhagen and then they had to build like a whole like fake body to like Mm -hmm. attach his head and be like this is what he looked like but he was there when they excavated kobeleman and so he was able to like preserve him and now that's at most guard museum but he wrote about these bog bodies in such like a humanistic kind of way and in such like a romantic way that it kind of like became this cornerstone of like the new danish cultural identity and Mm. because he was citing tacitus and because he was citing like all these people who spoke so highly of like germania and of like the scandinavians and everything he like brings in the myth of nerthus who was like this goddess of like the pond right Uh and that's sort of where he's like framing his theory that like oh like these were people who were sacrificed to like this goddess and like they did it in like the depths of winter when they were like trying to make sure that like spring would come like it was sacrifices in the name of like fertility and like survival and it was like very noble and like people gave themselves up to like ensure like the survival of like their family and like their clan and their friends and everything and it became this very like romanticized idea and it began to enter sort of like the danish cultural identity as like oh well we're descendant of these people right by virtue of living in the same place which is like a very Hmm. pivotal like it's it's place language and like culture are like the three cornerstones of like national identity like that's usually how people will like build their cultural identity is like we've lived in the same place as like these people or like we speak the same language as these people or like we have the same continuous culture as these people like it's all about like staking your identity on the past and using the past to legitimate your presence there in the present Hmm. um and so they were using it to sort of like rewrite their own history because they were trying to undo the narrative of like oh like vikings were bloodthirsty and they went like out raiding and like pillaging and raping and whatever to like no like we were people who sacrificed ourselves in the name of like the greater good to like protect our family to protect our friends and it's not a coincidence that that narrative begins like gathering steam in a time where Denmark is having like an identity crisis and wants to frame itself as like something nicer and noble and not like Nazi sympathizers. Not Nazi sympathizers, yeah. Yep. We're, we're, and... we're noble and self-sacrificing. That's why we let bad <laughs> things happen to us. Also, like, is that why it's gauche no. to point out that like every ethnic group in Europe migrated there from somewhere else and like we know this. Don't worry yeah. about it. Don't okay. worry about it. All right, cool. I mean, you know, I'm an American. I'm not about to throw stones in that department. But like, at least we know. <laughs> um, yeah, it's like it's burial mounds kind of get used the same way, where it's sort of like, and even like historically, burial mounds were used like that way in like the Viking Age, where like viking thanes would like point to like a burial mound and be like my great granddad is buried in that burial mound that's why i rule here that gives me my claim to like this land right yeah 
And it explains, maybe, this is, like, one argument that's been made. It's, like, the reason the burial mounds were, like, so big is because, like, Denmark in particular is so flat that you could see them from, like, miles away and you would know that, like, one, it was important because, like, it's a lot of effort to dig dirt up into a hill that's, like, 100 feet tall and, like, 100 feet wide. Um, yeah, And to add, like, claim to, like, stake claim to the land. To be like, we live here now and we know that we belong here because we've always lived here. Like, we know the people who are buried in that mound. Like, they give us, like, the legitimacy of place in this yeah. time. Which is a really interesting way to think about, like, where you live. Particularly now in, like, a very globalized world where there's a lot of movement between borders to the point where, like, you could argue physical borders don't really matter. Anymore, yeah. like, think about, like, the EU. Like, you don't need a passport to travel between any of those states. Like, there's not even, like, anyone standing there being like, welcome to France. Like, you just <laughs> left Spain. <laughs> like, you can just move freely between borders. And at that point, like, do physical borders matter? Yeah. And well, there's, there's arguments always... to be made both ways. Yeah. I mean, there's always been these really interesting, like, conflicts of what it means to be, like, the true king. Uh, yeah. Which is just always such a fun thing because it's like on the one hand it's like i'm the true king because my father was king etc cetera, etc cetera. but then it's like i'm the true king because my grandfather was deposed and our family's been in a hiding but now i'm back and it's like yeah. both of those things can be true like to different <laughs> people which of you is the true <laughs> king and ultimately right. i mean again one it's, it's kind of the same vein as like you know Things happen and then people justify them, or like people have beliefs and then they justify them with, you know, justifications. So it's At very, very good me. sentence framing on that from me. Uh, <laughs> but like, you know, whoever's on the throne is the true king because yeah. they're the king and they get to say like, ah, yes, well, you see, I, nice I rule you. this land because it was my Just destiny it because better. I, like it's a god. It's my divine right. I have exactly. a piece of paper that I wrote afterwards. Look at my charter. It says I belong here. Yeah, like like the gods themselves favored me because I won, and also like yeah. I'm descended yeah. from the gods maybe because I won. And and then on the other hand, it's like oh well, you know, I'm the true king because I'm like my, you know my my father was king, his father before him. This is his sword. You know, we've always ruled this land after we took it from these other people. You know, 500 years ago, uh, yeah. and it's like. You know, you know, people want legitimacy, yeah. and the Maybe idea that, like, like, divine right of kings and bloodlines and all that, it's oh, all, you know, it, oh, it's just excuses times. to justify yeah, whatever power yeah. system is currently in place, because whoever's in power wants to stay in power. Uh, and whoever's in and I get power the writes the history. Yeah, I get the impression so this is not a conversation you're supposed to have in the vicinity of England, but, like, I'm just... <laughs> Listen, Wait, I'm in Scotland. We're ready oh. to just shit on the English at oh, any yeah, moment. Absolutely. So, like, it's chill. <laughs> yeah, 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 100%. But yeah. yeah, no, you're totally right. Like, it is, like, again, kind of just, like, trying to, like, shoehorn the past into mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the present hey, in a way that, like, either, makes you look like, good at everyone else. Like, like shit, because you Can want I, to raise course. your own prestige level there. while lowering right. everyone else's. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I'll meet you over by y'all. Yep. And again, like people it's people weird. just don't feel okay comfortable being like, here? it's okay that's that we're the first people long. doing this. Like, it's, right. it's okay <laughs> that none of my fathers were kings. I'm going to run this place well. Like, the thing is, that does happen, actually. That that happens regularly. History change. you know, there are major historical turning points because someone's like, hey, I've right. never been the king, but I know how to run this place, or I'm going to help out, or I'm going to go off on my own and do my own thing and discover this thing or invent this thing. And then after that, that becomes the precedent. You know, the, yeah. the trailblazer doesn't have a precedent to follow, but they become the precedent for everyone after that because we love precedents and we love feeling like we, we sure have people do. on our side, even if they're people long dead in the past. Yeah, no, it's yeah. absolutely. Yeah. I, th I think we draw on the past to prove yeah. why we exist in a certain place and in a certain way in the present. Mm, yeah whether I or mean, not that's true because like you you brought up the point earlier where it's like if we pull up to a place and like evict the people that lived there didn't those people have the legitimacy to like be in that place and aren't we like the like incursion that like mm. doesn't really have any like ties to that place but if we just hunker down here for like a hundred years yeah then our kids have, we them, have right, right yeah. suddenly we have legitimacy by just being here for like a long time this is specifically a really spicy subject in, you know, mm. North America, because it's mm -hmm. like, you know, uh, everyone here who's not 
indigenous is like yeah like i you know my my ancestors came here but this is the only home i've ever known so like what 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 can I do? Who am know? I? <laughs> yeah, like, because uh, the idea is like, oh, you know, repatriation and, and stuff like that, like, or, or you know, returning land and, and stuff like that. This is a conversation that always stalls out as soon as it becomes like, well, but but who who loses that land now? Don't they have right. a right? They were born here. Their parents were born here. It's like, yeah, you know, this, this is this is where the conversation gets really uh, awkward because it's yeah. like, this is this is a fight that should have been resolved. 400 years ago right. <laughs> when the people who were actually at fault were doing terrible things and now it's yeah. like yeah, now it's really impossible to untangle yeah. it at Especially all because it's like you know you could make the argument and it has been made and it's a good argument that like people who are currently living with the benefits of the atrocities of their ancestors yeah. hold a responsibility because they are still reaping benefits of yeah. those bad actions. But then the question becomes, how do they fix it? How can they right. fix it? And that's where everything starts getting uh -huh. awkward. Yeah. And yeah, without I mean, a backing in indigenous studies, I don't feel super confident or comfortable yeah. taking super strong stances on this, by the way, because there's so many theoretical perspectives and I'm not, this is just gonna get into a hot tech zone that uh, I don't really <laughs> yeah. want to get into. We're in the spice zone. But in the meantime, a lot of stuff has happened in this. A in lot this of Iron stuff has sure happened has. while we've been wandering around. We got uh, pretty pictures. There's fruits now. We've been getting we've been getting fruits. Yeah, we've yeah, been we picking up we've been picking up fruit to feed the wolves because the wolves are herbivores. Uh, okay, sure. Yeah, don't worry about not it. Long. Uh, I'm not a veterinarian, but I. <laughs> also, uh, they they finally showed the prophecy of like Kratos is going to die in a chase. Yeah, we're going gonna... to look at those runestones in just a moment here because we've got time Yay. to wander around now. So you guys were deep in conversation though, so I wasn't going to kill it. That <laughs> sorry, we're going to kill it now. Uh, I saw but, you in chat. <laughs> firstly, uh, this guy looks like he's Starkather and Starky. Uh, maybe. Hmm. It's not super clear. Uh, the second strongest man who has six arms, maybe. Uh, we oh, love yeah. Him. Of course. He shows up in uh, Germundar Saga and is a couple other Spadofari places. Is that Spadofari underneath him? I uh, think so. Well, oh, yeah, that is 100%. That's a museum piece. That's, that's like a Gotlandic <laughs> picture stone, Spadofari. Yeah. No, a uh, oh, no. Not Spadofari. That's, that that's just fully Sleipnir. It's also very yes, funny because right. it's clearly in kind of a different style than the. Yeah, than we love his other. curly little legs. Exactly, he that's so noodly. From uh, <laughs> crap, that's from one of the Gotlandic stones. Uh, I think it is. Uh, hold on, let me see if I can find it. <laughs> if you find it, we'll look it up because I can't it looks... believe the adorable little like really stick like limbs in Hilda were also this. accurate to original True. Thor Sark. <laughs> the sky was really hard to nail down. Show well, me pictures. Really it's beautiful. And this is going to be Scott and Hattie. Uh -huh. Doing the kids their thing. Are flirting. Also, so they're cute. cute. They're in love. It's You've very been... cute. Chad has been freaking out over how cute they are and how cute the yak is. <laughs> she is cute. Little She's fluffy very cow. Cute. I can't believe they already gave us the moment of like, oh no, I can't control my powers. No, yeah. Don't worry, I'll call mute. Like, first thing, like, like, just, so just get it out of the way. It's going to be fine. <laughs> His hands are so hard to draw. <laughs> this exactly. is just the art department adding itself. <laughs> exactly. I do something that I do quietly uh, notice and kind of like is that we have all this background depiction of in this very like eighth century Gotlandic style of people with pointy helmets uh, standing yes. in straight lines, <laughs> and then anytime there's a giant, especially one of Angarvalo's family. They're done up in a style that seems to be much more representative of more modern Dine styles. Mm. So, right, that is... Interesting. Right, the, in the center here, right, she is not in a Norse style. She right? Yeah. Oh, no. This strikes me as being far more akin to Native American, especially Southwest Native American styles. Interesting. Which is... Has a lot of layers, and I may well be wrong here. Chat, please do correct me if you see thing, if you disagree. Uh, I will. I mean, I'll say that like she doesn't look like she's stylistically coherent with the rest of it because the main thing is like yeah. this era of art. There's almost never perspective on limbs. Yeah. Um, but, hands and feet are almost always shown in like a basically a side profile, no matter what pose the person is in. 
uh, but the figures here are given a lot more dynamism. So, like, um, obviously, you know, e Egyptian art, like, the, per the people would be yeah. in a silhouetted pose that is impossible for a human body, but it was so you would see all four of their limbs, you'd see their full facial features and si hey, side profile, but one? you'd, like, if you've ever seen, there. like, a, an Egyptian hieroglyph and been like, this, this doesn't quite that. look right, it's because the eyes are painted as though they are being seen from the front, despite being seen from the yeah. side. <laughs> but yep. it, it's... It's not. It's a form of stylization that portrays the whole figure in every case. You don't get this kind of like side view. One of the arms is obscured by the body. Yeah. Perspective dynamism that Earlier just didn't happen in, in the style of the era. So, the, the it, reason why this looks is weird is because it's modern. Uh, I don't you know, know I mean, if I would describe it as similar to Dine art, but I haven't seen much ago, of it recently, right? so I, I can't weigh in Odin super hard. But yes. yeah. Odin destroyed everything that remained of him, save uh -huh. one thing. But they're also mentioning a random, uh, a couple levels of uh, hot nonsense here. Uh, oh yeah. The free nipics. We love hot nonsense. Firstly, is that it, the so they mentioned this concept called the Utangarth, which mm. is the the mm -hmm. outer play. It's it's literally right. the outer world. Um, right. It's outer worlds. Like, the video right? game. It's yeah. just like uh, out. No, I mean, there's Utgarder as a place in the prose Edda, yeah. and then there's Utangarth as a generic, like, outside the borders of the farm spooky stuff happens here. Yeah. Okay. Um, I loved that lecture that we had where it was, like, the inside of, like, the property versus the outside. Yes. Yeah. Uh, that was so, a good one. Uh, it's also, uh, right, rela a related set of terms. There's Inanferth and Utanferth, right, the in-traveling... The voyage the from Iceland traveling. to Norway, mm. and the out traveling, the voyage from Norway to Iceland. Uh, and so all it just means is, like, vaguely farther out than wherever here is. And they're saying, no, no, what that is, is a specific spooky thing that allows people to uh, travel in their dreams. And it is Emir's dreams. Hmm. Oh. That's kind of cool, actually. It's narratively <laughs> very cool. It's mythologically hot nonsense. I was going to say, I've never heard of her. <laughs> no, Emir just dies. His personality is never a factor. His dreams are not important. Okay, but, but that is kind of cool. But his dreams are uh, spooky infinite sand desert, so I don't know that that's doing great. <laughs> well... I mean, he doesn't have much else to think about these days. <laughs> Snucks to be a landmass. Anyway. <laughs> My brains are clouds. I guess I'll think of sandstorms. Yep. Yep. <laughs> and then we have our runestones, which are our Yay. main actual runestones. <laughs> Casual. I wonder yeah. if they're going to do that, that one hearthstone that probably shows Loki's face. <laughs> probably not. Uh... Nah, be cheeky. It would be and cheeky. It would, it would lock Atreus into having to grow facial hair, which would be rather unfortunate. I don't know how <laughs> true. Uh, I do not want to see this child with a mustache. That sounds bad. <laughs> <laughs> no. I feel like you like, know he would think it was cool. He'd be uh, so proud of it. He'd be so proud of his first facial hair. He'd be like, "Look, Dad, I finally did it." Oh, I think my hair is on my upper lip. They, Atreus, um, like puberty's gonna hit him like a truck, but it's not gonna be pretty until it's done. No. <laughs> no. No. Uh. Also, they really, really, really don't want you to get a good look at what this last one actually depicts. Mystery oh, yeah. stone. Because they said, oh, this is the one in which Kratos is lying dead at Thor's feet and Loki is serving Odin. And yeah, we're yeah. like... Mm. It kind of just looks like Odin's got his hand on Atreus' shoulder. I feel like that can happen in a number of contexts. Exactly. And they've got a ton. <laughs> they've got a ton of writing on that stone, and they really yeah. don't want us to be able to see it and try and read it. How yeah. dare you block me from gaining knowledge? Yeah. They exactly. did that at the end of the last game, too. The, yeah. the, the wind they? that had blown the curtain aside stopped, and then you couldn't see the, the runestone where you die on it anymore. Boo. Like, yeah. All right, cool. They also have a bunch of writing here, and if I remember right, it's just like a repeating phrase. I'm not a runologist. I don't I remember. This is this business. is all this is all in Elder Food. I mean, this is from the previous game. Uh, yeah, this looks and, like just the events of the previous game. Um, and uh, they all write it in Elder Food Arc instead of Younger Food Arc, which I have hot takes about. Uh, but Elder Food Arc is the older one, right? Correct. Yeah. So that which would be is good. why it's bad. Which what? is what <laughs> the fact. Uh, 
it's the immediate el- opposite takes. <laughs> exactly. Right. Elder Food Arc is the older one and it has more runes and it was uh-huh. used in the fourth to seventh centuries, not the Viking Age. I mean, oh. she's mad old. She old old. <laughs> It's to, not to used fair, in the Viking means... Age. It's used for Proto Norse. <laughs> right, but the actual time that these games are happening in is like it's dubious. <laughs> you know, gods are I was around. Say, this is unknown time. Yeah. Um. There's like some pseudo mammon style like stylation on Jormungandr on this little rune stone here. <laughs> also, there's runes along the edge here, which feels mostly like a nod to the fact that there's random unrelated messages on historical rune stones. <laughs> Excellent! Yes, but sadly, there's no way to get zoomed in enough for us to actually be able to take a look at what they are. Uh, no. so you'd have to call in Christian and see if he could like, translate the runes for you. <laughs> True. The they're only probably, runologist I know. They're probably just transliterated English. Um, I assume oh, yeah. so. That's I don't for, think anyone went in there and was like, let me do the proper formatting for this. Yeah. Certainly not. The, But yeah, right, these... I mean, they strike me as too big, but it is, like, roughly the right color scheme. Uh, That's true. We love red. Like, we yeah. love red, we love green, and we love sure random do. random okay. unrelated messages around what is otherwise a very interesting mythological scene. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 100%. You know. <laughs> also, this this guy, this guy, I mean, it's Thalmer from the previous this game, guy. but he looks like he's one of, like, the mask figures, uh... Right, oh, from, no. like... you know what he looks like? Uh, he, he looks like that one depiction that people think might be Loki on the cross. Yeah, yeah, the yeah, yeah, yeah. I know oh, yeah. exactly which one. Yeah, he, yeah. yeah. He uh, like... Kirk B. Stevenstone. I know exactly yeah. which one it is, yes. too. Uh, oh, let's yeah. pull it up. I'm going to get a good grade in Norse mythology. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to win at Norse mythology. I think that yeah. is possible to do and normal to want. <laughs> True. <laughs> Uh, let me pull up a picture of the guy yes, so we can grab it. it. Uh, image in new tab, click on that, and then boom. Now I we just we zoom in. We all look at him and we're like, we know this man. Yeah, yeah hold on. <laughs> I've, seen I've seen this seen, man before. <laughs> I've seen your face before. There's the bitch. <laughs> See what I the mean? man. There he is. It's not on flawless one to one, but he looks like at least he's kind of derived from him. He's got yes. triangle face. Yeah, bad yeah. case of triangle face. Yeah. The other guy, stylistically, he reminds me a lot of is uh, the one of the Orhus runestones. Uh, I was just thinking the same thing. The one at Yelling, right? Hold on. Let me see if I can... The, uh, the, the one at Yelling. Different one. I, I'm thinking of the like dude with his tongue sticking out. Maybe we're thinking of the same thing. I'm trying to like find the picture now. Of what I'm is this? Of. Is this boy? Oh, that's yeah, a... <laughs> that's the one. That's the what one I was that? thinking of. Yeah, yes. look at that thing. <laughs> He's about the to sing a song about the alphabet. <laughs> <laughs> this is the original Kermit the Frog. <laughs> Here, <laughs> I love him. God. Yep. My beautiful little baby boy. <laughs> my yep. son. My, my handsome son man. whom I have raised from birth. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, oh, I love him. Little spooky pizza slice. I don't know what's going on. Oh, yep. a pizza. That would be such a good idea. Okay. Mm, true. <laughs> <laughs> also, on, uh, the, other, the other one we saw earlier is basically just this guy, right? Yeah, it's the yeah. little horse. Yeah, yeah which is, is from the Tiangvida image, though. Sure is. <laughs> I love him with little noodle legs. Though there's noodle a bunch legs. of other ones that also show uh, Yeah, Slapnir. there's a lot of runestones that have Sleipnir on it. He's super yeah. popular in Gotland in, like, the 8th century, and I don't know why. I wonder if this was another case of, like... Like we were talking about with the petroglyphs earlier, with the animals with like multiple versions of heads or like trunks or limbs, so that when the firelight flickered over, like was Sleipnir originally just for like flipbook purposes, and then they were like, it ain't like a horse. He just That's had crazy. like six legs, I think, right? Mm-hmm. Unless hey. I'm completely wrong. Well, the wrong. thing is, in the mythology, it, he, has he does. Eight. He, he yeah. has eight yeah. legs because having more legs makes you run faster. Sure but, like, does. <laughs> but I wonder if that was almost derived from the. Anyway, I mean, I, this is getting into the full it conspiracy another one of zone. Your <laughs> um, Gotta go fast. Gotta go fast. (laughs) Face first. Yeah. I like, I like his little hammer-shaped head. Like, his head just looks like a Thor's hammer. Yeah. Yeah. That's funny. Yep. 
And he's got he's got the triangle head very well. And yes, uh, someone had asked, isn't this the guy that Freya reanimated in the last game? Yes, this is Thaumer, uh, who got oh. reanimated in the last game. Uh, you can see him dead right there. Uh, but also, he's you got can like tell a quadrillion he's bleeding references. heavily from his head. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He got a, and it's bleeding what appear to be words, looks like. Yup. Great. It's just him Good saying, work, ouch. Ouch, 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 ouch. True. <laughs> Someone get a runologist to confirm, please. He's just <laughs> recommending that Freya get like family therapy with Balder instead of doing this hot nonsense. She said no. I want to yeah. act messy. True. I wish we could. I'm I here really, in my revenge era. <laughs> I really wish I could get just like a photo. Like, there's got to be some sort of photo mode in this dang game. Chat, is there a photo mode in this game? I will Google it. Hold on. It's, if a there's a photo mode, mode, the pace of this playthrough is about to tank real fast. <laughs> oh, no! <laughs> uh, while we were looking that up, though, uh, Nayarfine did cheer 100 bits. The gods are preceded in existence by their enemies, the Yuknar, or anti-gods, who are also the parents and lovers of many gods. Could it be significant that the universe is imbued with evil from the very beginning, and that the good beings are ultimately made from the evil? We've got some things that need clearing up with that idea. Firstly, uh... <laughs> The Yutnar are not evil. Uh, I think a much more plausible way to look at them is that they are fairly primordial, right? They are the same attributes as a lot of the gods, but the unusable version. So, right? The untempered, untamed kind yeah, of... Yeah, I don't want to say untamed specifically, but like it's wildfire instead of a hearthfire. Uh mm. Or uh, it's the wild sea instead of the usable sea, or it's the ice that ruins your boats, uh, versus, or, you know, things like that, uh, which are not, right, they're not friendly, but they're not evil. Uh, in D&D terms, they're just unaligned. Yeah, also the idea that, like, being the enemy of the ice, sir, makes them evil is... I think propaganda. I think that's just I think that's just accidental bleed through from modern uh, sort of like uh, the universalization of Christianity to a certain extent. The idea yeah. that the gods are automatically good is not accurate in yeah. any religion. I mean, <laughs> I'd right. say even Christianity. Right. Anyway. The, the, go the gods have to are good in that you pray to them to accomplish things. Uh, but... I think it's more that gods are necessary. Exactly. It's, it, it, you know, you deal with them, and if you slight them, bad things happen, but it's not that, you know, you're supposed to think that they're always right or always good. Yeah. Um, I mean, even in, you know, even in the Torah, like Book of Job, it's like, God gets mad when you ask him questions, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't. <laughs> um, exactly. <laughs> uh, I... So, there's, there's, anyway. Um, I wholeheartedly I think the agree. Internet... The internet just told me, I just found this, that I mean, you can apparently you use photo leave. mode through the no, options menu. I, I don't uh -huh. know if that's true or not. Through the <laughs> options menu? Okay. <laughs> Girl, what a terrible way to access photo mode. Uh, yeah. That's fine. But the thing is that the Jotuns are, I mean, even setting aside the, the Jotun daughters that are frequently married to the Iser, uh, like, a lot of the time, the the Iser are unequivocally the wrongdoers in their dynamics yeah. with the, the Jotun. Like, basically the only exception is... Yeah, yeah. Pretty much the only time that that is unequivocally not the case is when Thrym steals Thor's hammer. Um, and it, even then, it's like, he's trying to use it to coerce them to make Freya marry him. That's a dick move. Uh, but, like, depowering their greatest enemy is just a smart tactical decision, and they're they're at war. And they have been at yeah. war since the Iser, uh reneged on their... Um, well, uh, uh, their deal with rebuilding with the uh, Jotun rebuilding. No, that, that, that's an awful lot of canon. That's an awful lot of canon attached to uh, a story that is uh, Loki got captured, got bullied into helping well, steal it, run away. Uh, I know. I'm just saying, like, if if you even if you're just reading the text of it, it's like, yeah, the Jotuns are frequently antagonistic, but yeah. they explicitly have a reason to be. And, I'd also... and I would argue they're not any more antagonistic than, like, the Aesir or, like, anyone else that they deal with. Like, it's no, you're dealing with a pantheon not. that's inherently built off of, like, regular human emotions. Like, the gods, if you're looking at religion from, like, an anthropological point of view, like, religion reflects culture. Mm -hmm. And it tends to be reflected more that way, I think, in, like, pantheons and just, like, polytheistic religions because you just have way more... More opportunity options. to yeah, yeah exactly you just you just have more options to get like the full spectrum of like human like folly and human achievement and so like you get like a lot of like you the, the gods are not faultless mm. and i think it's like 
one of the I don't even know like how to say this <laughs> like one of the not it's not like an issue with Christianity but like one of the hard things about Christianity is that like in a way it's a monotheism that's trying to be like a polytheism and it's polytheism no. that's trying to be I a monotheism too. and it's really mm, really well, hard to squeeze oh, like the All vast kind of like Monsters, range of human emotion artifacts, when you only have like a single god in yeah. that and way that and if you <laughs> kind of combine that with the general like no. this being can't really be questioned or you know <laughs> debated with or anything yeah, like that right it, it, i mean you know i'm i'm jewish i have you know a horse in this race <laughs> um, <laughs> the, the idea that you can't question or argue with an authority figure maybe, has never uh, sat right with me and mine faster. but like the, no the specific no. idea uh, that like the totality of being of must be this contained within a being easier. who is mm. also Got it. good and benevolent right. that's that's this always been a, a subject of, of difficulty of like you know you the old can you be all powerful and we, all good and unquestioned right. and etc cetera, etc cetera. and it's like yeah we are 100% opening another kind of worms. I don't oh, necessarily... Oh, we sure are. We will step I... away from this. Let's... We went right into the spice <laughs> we, we sure did. And while I could use this as a chance to shill for Pentiment, uh, we're yeah. going to not do that <laughs> and instead just turn away. Uh, okay. We instead have had two compliments redeemed, uh, one okay. by some nameless punk and exactly. one by the myth nerd. So, Lynn, have you seen anything in this game we're so coming. far that we're you coming. super duper really There's like? Um... I really like Angerboda. I think she's really cute. Hell yeah. I, so I just like the whole take on their relationship is really cute and like aging them both down to like be kids, I think is a really fun nuanced take because obviously like the mythology really deals with like, like adults huh. and like adult yeah. emotions and I haven't just, seen me, the take yet where it's like they're both I mean, just like kids the, and they're trying to figure it out. I mean, the mythology actually right has this bad habit of saying they are kids for all of three days and then they're adults and have adult emotions. Right. <laughs> or do adult things. It's like Greek mythology being like Aphrodite was never a child. It's like yeah for the goddess of sexuality right. and love that's probably smart. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But it is really interesting because I don't think like Angerboda gets like a lot of love from people who like study Never. the mythology. And I like Never. her. I think she's great. And I, I think like the whole like I love Loki as just like a literary character anyway, because I feel like there's always so much more complexity in like the quote unquote like bad guys. Mm. So there's only like so many ways that you can like be good, but there's like a limitless amount of ways that you can like be not good. And yeah. I think that's where like the creativity and like storytelling lies is in like the complicated, like morally ambiguous gray area characters. And so it's, it's just like, it's a really interesting relationship. And yeah, isn't it, um, is it the myth of Balder like, when he dies and they try to, like, bring him back mm -hmm. from hell? Yeah. Isn't it, like, yes. if everybody, like, wishes for, like, his return everybody or something, cries. he'll come back? If everybody cries, that's it, exactly. Uh, and it's, like, the one giantess, like, doesn't. Who might be Loki in disguise. I was gonna say, who might be Loki in disguise, and it's such an interesting... take. Loki in general is such, like, an interesting character and to like play with sort of like the gender bending oh, yeah. aspect mm -hmm. of him being the giantess no, no, him being no, no. like the female oh. horse in yeah. the relationship yeah. with yeah, Svadofari it's, it's it's just such an interesting yeah thing and I don't know I I've always had like the opinion that they do it to sort of like show Whoa. that he's like the odd one out that it isn't necessarily to be like, oh, like, we're introducing, like, a queer character because, like, mm. we're open-minded about, like, queer people. Like, I feel like it's always kind of been, like, the opposite. Where it's like, well, look I at how weird this person is and we're gonna queer code them because mm. that's strange. Or actually, Adam, I remember you had a point about this, I want to say last stream, uh, or maybe the first one. Uh, that, uh, there's another yeah. character in Norse mythology who very frequently does things that are explicitly sort of breaking gender norms and it's Odin it's who practices yes. women's magic for yep. using magic. Uh, our, it is yeah. fascinating. Our mutual friend Erin and uh, Lynn, mm -hmm. right? I'm just copying Erin's work here. <laughs> yeah. Oh, very good. <laughs> As we do. Hell yes, yeah. yes. <laughs> we love taking from our friends. <laughs> exactly. I mean, what, what is the field of archaeology and anthropology <laughs> if, not... if not just stealing from people and putting a quick footy on that? <laughs> <laughs> but no, it is really, really interesting because there is, like, so much emphasis on the fact that, like, magic 
is this like backhanded technique because like obviously in a culture where like okay. you're basing yeah, your like honor on the fact it that you're doing like close up like combat any there. kind of like long range weapon is going to be considered like yeah. cheating because except like for bows sometimes yeah. except for bows sometimes, sometimes. <laughs> But, like, magic in particular, I think, okay. is considered so, like, underhanded because, well, like, you, you can't you do you anything think? against yes. that. Like, you can see if someone's, like, pointing a bow and arrow at you and, like, conceivably you could, like, dodge an arrow or you could, like, lift your shield and, like, block it. Like, you can't really have, stop like someone. Yeah, deflect yeah. it with your <laughs> lightsaber. Exactly. Yeah. But you, like, you can't Stay block you. magic in that same way and so it gets considered like underhanded and it's like associated with like women's work because women mm. are second rate citizens in most yeah. societies no matter how much what you want to imagine that like viking well culture was this like feminist oh. utopia like no no, <laughs> no just anytime no. someone is like well you see the uh the partitioned role that women had to roll had to do in the society had a couple things in it that were kind of cool it's like oh great Hang on. we are we are win. in a, we are in an yeah. ad break to anyone who is oh, not no. subscribed anyone who oh, is not subscribed anyone wow. who is not subscribed might be getting ads right now uh Oops. our apologies enjoy your ads all right, if Chad, you... if you could hear us, uh, put a banana in there. You know what wait. you know what to do. <laughs> wait, so hang on. In the, chat. <laughs> the international hang, sign of spice Hang on, wait, wait, wait. We have, we, have, we have follower emotes uh, that we can use instead. <laughs> Sick. Throw up an emote, uh, kids. Yeah. Exactly. Emote spam for our follower emotes. I... <laughs> Lebanon. I've seen <laughs> good, you. good. They can hear us. Okay. Uh, well, some of them can but hear yeah, us. Especially with like Norse, uh, you know, Viking culture, et cetera, et cetera, and Norse mythology. The, the, oh, the whole like, oh, yeah, the women got to own property and like they did the yeah. math because they thought it was witchcraft. It's like, that's cool. But I think any society that tells you, hey, because of the gender you were born, this is the only thing you're allowed to do in your life, regardless of what right. that only thing is, that is inherently oh a, a yeah. civilization that Let's drop even if it's not explicitly like left, yeah. misogynistic then, is still sexist yeah, that uh yeah, in that that it is saying your your world your destiny is laid out because of the circumstances of your birth and nothing under your control yeah. and nothing specific okay? to who you are yeah. as a person Just... like no matter how how girl bossy the assigned role can yeah. be that society is still not a good role model. <laughs> no, because well, you're still distinct. You're still making the distinction between like girl boss and like, for lack of a better word, like boy boss. Like yeah, you're, you're still, still drawing, people. right? Yeah. You're that, still creating those gender lines. That's something that gets lost in the conversation because whenever someone says like, oh, you know, the, the patriarchy hurts men too, everyone's like, oh yeah, it must be so terrible. And it's like if you're told from birth that because right. of who you are and nothing you can control, you have to be an emotionless, stoic right. ass kicker. And then like, oh, you're subject to the draft, you know, you can be pulled from your, your job and told to do this. And like, that is bad for you. That's yeah. bad for a lot of people. And the idea that like, just because society is telling you you're Daniel's strong and cool, genitive. what they're actually saying is not you yet. have to be strong you, or cool or else. That's not, not good. That's expectations. Right. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, it's, it's the idea that like Sorry. girls are easier to manipulate because all you have to do is like That's put a girl right. in front of any kind of like social media and she'll learn how to like police herself. But mm -hmm. boys are easier to neglect because we assume that they don't need any kind of like emotional support either like as they're growing up or like as adults and so it's just yeah. like nobody's benefiting nobody's benefiting this is bad for side. everybody and like I... you can acknowledge that you have privileges based off of like your gender oh. or your race while also acknowledging that you live in a bad really system like that this, is not helping you the way that it should be yeah like it can be both yeah which is also why like looking for looking to old civilizations for precedent for why this is yeah. good actually is like no guys this was bad for them too it was Rip. bad for everyone. It's, like, it's, just... it's cool that that one shield maiden maybe got a burial right. of befitting her ass kickery. It's cool that whatever system she lived in, she did what she wanted, if that's what happened. Right. But <laughs> that doesn't mean the culture One was case does good. not make your entire culture. Like, no. it's just, you can't draw that kind of information yeah. no. from it, it, that like... stuff. If I can I'm go sorry, did that just that happen in the game? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so what's the soul in your I'll knife? The what? Yes. <laughs> that's that's totes your mom, isn't it? That's absolutely. I don't know. Okay. I'm sure that'll Stays get brought up there. again. 
I won't tell because I know the answer. <laughs> oh! What you doing? I, I watched a playthrough of the entire game, so like oh, I know how it ends, so I'll just keep my mouth shut yep. about Hell yeah. And uh, then so we're gonna no take spoilers. a nice calming break Easy by enough. skimming stones. Um, yeah, excellent. Okay. Riveting God. gameplay. I love that Atreus <laughs> is just having this adorable date night in, in yeah. not Jotunheim while probably Kratos is losing his fucking no, mind. No. I'm, sure it'll, I'm I mean, sure it'll be fine. I'm sure it'll be fine. the question of like, did he just go like oh, mind traveling and like is his mind here and like his body is just like unconscious in bed at home? Uh -huh. Kratos just like shaking him okay. awake up, boy. <laughs> He's just napping. I have to be emotionally distant at you. <laughs> Wake up so I can tell you every mistake you've made in the last five right. minutes. I need to once more reaffirm that you are nothing more than my son. You're my boy. Bring are you feeling validated yet? <laughs> <laughs> Am I doing better than last game, boy? Hey, I just don't know what I'm doing wrong. <laughs> I wish my wife was here. <laughs> she was so good at parenting while I didn't parent. <laughs> True. She really carried that invisible emotional baggage of raising an entire child. Wow, when Faye was around, I spent whole days not even saying a word. It was I didn't even know I had a boy. It was wonderful. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> funny. Ow. This, is a, this is a good game. I also like this that now you have combo moves. Yes. Yeah. We also have. Look at my two children working together. They're so Look cute. at them both drop kicking the same bad guy at the same time. God, you love to see it. Aww. Uh, <laughs> this is love. The best thing about this <laughs> dynamic is that when people in the fandom are like, what kind of kids would these two have? They have an answer. <laughs> True. <laughs> like, well. <laughs> Spoilers. It's uh, very many, and they uh, maybe destroy the world. Big snack. <laughs> Their big, kids are just a bunch dog. of furries. That's all you need to know. A, a, a bunch of furries and hell. <laughs> Yay! Two furries and a goth kid. That sounds about right. Yeah. Big Adam's family Same. energy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, true though. But yeah, I really like this take on like their relationship in general. Because I think mythologies in general, you're just kind of like locked into the fact that like you have to convey a lot of information in not a lot of space because like they all started as oral traditions pretty much like i don't think there's a single like origin myth that kind of like comes after writing has entered that society no it's 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 almost always pre-writing yeah um, and so it's like you're limited by like just the amount of like shit that whoever's telling the story can remember and so i feel like a lot of the stuff that gets like laid by the wayside is like growing up stuff and like what childhood was like unless it's like pivotal to like the adult god or whoever like that that story is gonna follow but i feel like a lot of it is just like they're grown up and they're gonna stay that way and like we don't need to know what like their growing up and their childhood was like Nah, why would we? It's fine. No, they're really just allegories for like human emotions. So like, eh. exactly. Eh. <laughs> well, totally that it's interesting. It is, yeah. Because I'm like trying to remember. I don't think we get any childhood of like the Norse gods, do we? Not really. Uh, Odin, Vili, and Ve just kind of spring into existence and are murdered yeah. in there immediately. Um. Yeah, I just do we get Baldur's childhood because no. he's like the only one no. I can remember no. outright. Who's he like shows up. He the first time he like gets any character is when he starts Where having bad dreams about his death. I have something for you. Yeah. Fair enough. Uh, I mean, you can have those rough. when you're a child, but like, <laughs> but, I, yeah. but still, but yeah, like they're all pretty much like they just uh, sort of spawn as I, uh, like adults. Yeah, and then it just like goes years. from there. Like you never really get like yeah. the growing up. I mean, even if you look at like epic poems and things like that like a lot of them start off at like the age of like 33 which is like obviously an important number in multiple cultures and is part of like the hero's journey and everything and like mm -hmm. yeah. a lot of stories follow that arc that like a man's yeah. life starts at like 33 which like makes sense because it's like around the age that you would like probably start inheriting like property and things from like yes your yes. parents. For, yes. for the kids, yep, there is the one um, at the Just end something. of, of Thor, Stralfa. Uh, Thor kills a giant, giant falls on top of his face. Uh, his three-day-old son, Magni, uh, picks up the giant. 
It'll be ah. one, one whole anecdote. What about my problem? Excellent. That is, well, that's that something true. interesting because the, the point about I like how do? the gods generally there's aren't no uh, children you is like you can try whatever you want to avoid mortal it. heroes don't often have anymore. precocious You're youth stories. They're like, oh, like Heracles. Hercules. Yeah, yeah. He, he throttled Ever? two snakes I mean, while in his cradle. Exactly. Um, yeah. Or like uh, Kukulin, not even 17. Uh, yes. Kicking yeah. ass, you know, all that stuff. But yeah. like gods, the most you get, there are some stories about like young Zeus a little bit just because mm. the circumstance. Well, the thing is, young Zeus and young Hermes. Uh, and young Apollo, uh, and technically young Art. Okay, so a lot so of the younger the Greek gods, gods are not, maybe aren't the best example here. Well, the thing is, Greek gods are actually a very interesting example because <laughs> the older generation, they they kind of oh, get things about like we'll in the in the large them. scale how they usurped the one. Titans. Yeah. Like okay, yeah. you know they were all swallowed except for Zeus. He was raised uh-huh. elsewhere. Then he showed up as an adult and kicked ass. Um, yes. That's mostly what There's you get. Some... But like. Hermes yeah, was, you know, like doing hijinks day about. one. Um, up Artemis in so- okay, okay. okay. Artemis and Apollo is a different rabbit hole, but we're not going to do that. But the point is, like, <laughs> sometimes, like, Artemis is born and then immediately assists her mother with the delivery of Apollo. Yes. Uh, Love in her, her. Yeah. In, in her role <laughs> as sort of one of the goddesses affiliated with childbirth. Uh, yeah. And Apollo, in some versions, like th- there are basically stories yeah. that Artemis and Apollo Time do before, before they officially become gods. recognized as gods, Follow but me. that's a little bit ambiguous and might be mm-hmm. sort of retconning. So, like, mm. uh, Apollo kills Python very early on, but usually he's not like a child. He's yeah. okay, you know, he's like a teen. Yeah. Or he's just or like young. A young. He's not man. a man. Yeah. That's the thing. It's it, the thing is, I think the idea that gods have childhoods, the reason why they don't for the most part is because. It's it's just sort of exposing a, a blind spot in the way we think of gods. Yeah. We think of them like fictional characters, you know? Yeah. Uh, but at the time, it's like, this is an eternal, timeless being, you know? This is a yeah. concept in our culture. Why would it have had a childhood? Right. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. But at the same time, it's like, it's an interesting idea that it's like, they can have deaths, but they don't really, and like, they have births, but they don't have that, like, one little spot yeah. in the middle. Yeah. I where mean, it's I like, think oh, ex- like, what happened to you fundamentally to, like, make you this way? Yeah. I mean, yeah. You could argue that that's, stories. like, right, like, and you could argue that that's, like, important to, like, the characterization of, like, each one is, like, what happened to you, like, in your childhood that, like, made you the way that you are as, like, an adult god. And I mean, like, some of the gods just, like, spring, like, from each other, presumably fully right. formed and just ready to go. Yeah, exactly, you know. Which is super, super interesting. Yeah. yeah. Um, and they, they sort of answer some of those questions. Like, the number of times that gods are born from, like, the bodily fluids of other gods is not yeah. small. Uh, no. Especially in Norse mythology and Egyptian mythology, it's just, like, a thing yeah. that happens. It's the easiest explanation, because the thing is, ultimately, like, I think the question, where did this god come from, is important enough from, like, a theological standpoint yeah. that it does get an answer most of the time. Like, oh, it's the offspring of this other god or whatever. But the yeah. question of, like, how did this god grow up? Nobody seems to mind really matter. Yeah. No, which is no. weird. Long and which is because I, I think you brought up an interesting point that like yeah, like the demigods and like the human, like epic, poem kind of characters, they do often get like information like that, like Achilles getting dipped into like the water as like a baby yeah. by his yeah. mother to be like protected. Hera, and nurse, like Hera, that. Uh, Hera nursing Heracles, and that's why he becomes so right. strong. The, yeah. there, there's a comment that right, childhood is a modern concept. That's incorrect. Let's be clear. Yeah. Childhood is an ancient concept. Uh, Teenagerhood is a modern concept. Even <laughs> then, not That's like the Norse. Shaky. The Norse law codes have this phase between twelve and sixteen, where they recognize that you're no longer quite a child, but you're also definitely not legally an adult. <laughs> Your frontal yeah. lobe has not solidified. It's like, okay, this is the age when kids start figuring out that sex is a thing, but long before we find it comfortable to think about that. <laughs> but also, when they this can is start... when they suddenly realize they're an independent entity and well, are trying uh... to test their spot in the world. M- mostly that one, because 12 is the age at which they start being legally allowed to swear oaths, but they're not allowed to Love prosecute it. their own cases or own property until they're 16. Good. Yep. So that four I mean, year what? like gap of just gray morality <laughs> where you can just agree to like the most banana shit that there are no consequences. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, most most cultures have the concept of like an age of majority, uh, basically mm-hmm. at which point people are like, I have to consider you like a full person now. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
because it's like look, the thing is Got like it. kids are great kids are precocious but like i remember being a kid and i didn't know what the fuck i was doing most of the time no, i was learning none. like i'm that's 26 just how I st i'm still there <laughs> well that's the thing like I, i'm still learning but like i i remember what it yeah. was like to not know how the world worked and to sort of be like learning the axioms by which reality operated yeah. on one experience at a time and that's that's visible from the outside. Like kids will make certain connections much faster than adults because they don't have those preconceptions oh, of how the yeah. world must oh, work. Marbles. But it's learning they, those preconceptions that is what the differentiates world? children from adults. Not these, but... um, mm -hmm. It's hard too, because I think like as you're growing up as like a child, particularly as like an early teenager, like you're the smartest you've ever been. Like in that moment, you have the mm. most knowledge that you've ever had like in your life. And yeah. to you, that's but everything. I like, I think that's a reason why, like, a lot of teenagers at, like, 14, 15, 16 are like, I know everything that I need to know. Like, I've done it. Like, I know exactly how the world works. Because, like, it's the smartest you've ever been. Like, yeah. it's the yeah. most self-aware you've ever been. As an adult looking at that child thing, <laughs> I know what I'm doing, you're like, mm. there's, like, a bit more learning you can oh. do. But, like, it's tough. Yeah, to like it's, square that yeah, and to yeah. like try to make like decisions for kids when they're like so sure of themselves. Yep, for sure. Like it's, a Trey, it's the most you've ever known. Like a right. is be, being oh. sure he knows what these marbles are and just right. fully <laughs> yeeting the souls of giants. These belong to the giants. Oh and, god, like, is that what he's been fully doing? Into like his Loki identity, he's like, oh. "This is me now. I've associated this with my personality." Uh huh. Uh huh. I had a choice. And then you stand there and you're like, you silly little child, you are your father's Thanks, son. <laughs> True. Uh, Waiting for Odin to find a way into slaughter. Yeah, the giants uh, have been orbed, it they looks like. Sure, they got and Pokeballed. Angerboda is now pondering <laughs> the Pokeball. <laughs> yes. Father, they got Pokeballs. Their souls in. Uh, <laughs> but, by the way, uh, kind of repeating something from a I'm previous stream, they have shared another hundred bits for when and how and when did Wodan Super see Tyr as the chief god? Not oh, how that boy. works. Not how that works. Uh, Tiwa, there's no evidence to suggest that Tiwa's was ever the chief god, except that his name is the word for god. There is yeah. no... I'd say that is, you know, No substantive, <laughs> but, like, the linguistic evidence doesn't include any detail, so putting a date to it is physically freaking impossible. And it's, yeah. a, broadly speaking, a misconception uh, that is strongly prosecuted by scholars in the 30s, 40s, and 50s that is no longer accepted. Are you sure? I think there's... I, I don't know if this is still legit. I think there was a discussion of the idea that, like, Odin and a few of the other gods were, like, the gods of a group of people that moved into the area. Yeah. Uh, and, I, like, the thing is, like, you don't really get divine civil wars that aren't accompanied in some way by like a real historical power shift. Uh, if you look at Egyptian mythology, it's fun because you can actually pin down exactly this what uh, what paradigm shift was happening when they were like, this god is now the big, the, the most important yours. one. There's a story where, where she gets we all her power. We only believe in the Aten now. Yeah. Well, that one was <laughs> definitely, nice. no, that I'm was done. the most spicy one, but it's like, oh, uh, <laughs> Isis has uh, goes, acquired Ra's secret name and now has all of his power and is going to use it to govern wisely and justly. And it's like, okay, I wonder why that story exists. Or like, there's a straight up just myth about Hatshepsut being like the true child of like, um, whichever sun god was in charge at the time. You know how this goes. Uh, yeah. and, and and the thing is, like, there are also clear points well, of evidence, especially in Greek mythology, where it's like, this was the god of a different group of people. They brought the god with them, told stories of that god. The god got integrated into the uh, the Greek pantheon. Mm -hmm. You know, Aphrodite from Phoenician traders. No. Apollo or Artemis or both might be Minoan, but that one's very spicy uh, and kind of hard to tell. Um, huh. Dionysus for a while, the theory was that he was an import god until they kind of concluded that he'd been there longer than anyone. Um, so the idea that perhaps Tyr and some of the other gods were like the gods of one group of people there. and Odin and some of the other gods were the gods of another group of people and the groups collided and other stuff happened. Because of that is a... I don't know. That's usually marked for the Aesir Vanyar War, but Tyr isn't one of the Vanyar. No. Well, the thing is, the Aesir Vanyar War is an instance of a thing that happens in almost every... Indo-European right. folklore where except, there's a war between gods. Except I also don't think that's true because uh, turns out the war between gods war is a pretty common thing cross-culturally and the idea that two I'll groups that. would get, get along right there. The evidence doesn't actually hold together very well given that the all of the Vanya that we know have no cognates in other Indo-European cultures linguistically. Well, the, the problem is uh, <laughs> 
there, the, here's the thing. All the Proto-Indo-European linguistic reconstruction thing is kind of nonsense, but at the same time, it is like, okay, you have the you have the devas and uh, the the oh, fuck. Uh, there's a thing in Hinduism that is a war the between Asuras two of gods. Yeah, yeah, devas, devas and the asuras, which is cognate with Iser. Uh, so it's like, it, okay? except which one is the good guy god group is flipped <laughs> from one to the oh. other. Like that's the kind of parallel where you're like, okay. Something happened. Okay. Uh, there's the, the in Greek mythology. There's generations of it. There's the Titans versus the sort of like the primordial pre-Titans, and then the gods versus the Titans. Um, but it is still, you know, it, it's an Indo-European mythology. There's a god war, and there are many, many uh, religions and mythologies in the world where there is no god war. Um, yeah. There is no god war in uh, Egyptian mythology. There are individual god disputes, uh, but it's basically just everybody versus Set and occasionally Apophis. Uh, or Apep, sorry. Uh, and the thing is, like, you know, it, it's easy to say, oh, this is a universal thing, but it's more interesting to say it's not universal, but it shows up in, like, these four locations and yeah. nowhere else. Sure, but um, the, the, the flip, flip side is the... Do we have enough information about the cultural context in which each of them is produced to actually say that they are the same thing? Or is there something else that's creating this parallel? Right. And those are not mutually contradictory things. Right. Uh, it's just... The more we I've looked at the Aesirvania war, war, the less I think it actually parallels these other texts particularly well. If there's nothing else because we know so damn little about it. Well, that's it might thing. just be that people thought that God Wars made for fun reading yeah. and good entertainment. Well, if that were the case, we'd probably know more about them. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. Like the, the a little is, mystery. Sorry. I think that. that the the sort of it's an so, Indo-European mythology. Uh, there's a God War. I think you could marbles. make the argument that like the, that the, the history of that not part of the world is a lot of small so groups of people this. moving around. Yeah. Sometimes coming into conflict, sometimes combining. There are a lot of stories of explanations for how mm -hmm. this god came from somewhere else, or this god came from another group, but then became part of us. And if you want to draw easy parallels, you can easily parallel that to almost any, like, this this group of people, they came from somewhere else, but now, you know, they intermarried, they're part of us. Yep. You know, oh, there was a god war, and now there was a hostage exchange, so we have Lara. some of their gods. And they took one of their god, one of our gods, but Has then they killed him, and now we have him back again. So really, That's he's still kind of one of ours. Um, yep. Like... It, it parallels Something the real movement of real groups of people believes, so yeah. well what, that, yeah. What, what's really so funny is that this is the he, take that Snorri Sturlason on has in Inglinga Saga. Oh, oh sorry, father. person in chat pointed out the, the thing that I was remembering, but couldn't remember the name of. Zoroastrianism has Ahuras and Devs, which are flipped in which one is good and bad I'm versus the, uh, yeah. the, and the Devas and Asuras, exactly. Yeah. But they're all cognate with each other. You know, yeah. it's an Indo-European mythology, uh, there's a god war. And going from, going from Indo-Iranian <laughs> to Indic is a much smaller linguistic jump than going from Indic to uh, oh. Germanic. Mm. Right, those are two much more closely related and much more directly in contact groups. So, seeing... Hi, Fox. Um, see, seeing those two as being... Um, I think it's more tenable the closer contact they are and the more similar the context of production is uh, for there to be an actual link there. But right, the classic example of why we should be suspicious of the Indo-European God War is Irish, where the Fovera are 9th century anti-Norse propaganda. Yeah. We run oh, around. really? Yeah. Are we, are we sure about that yeah. now? Yes. Uh, okay. Emmett, Emmett talked, uh, just uh, brought it up, and as usual, I trust Emmett in all things uh, Irish because they're very good at it. <laughs> I'm trying to remember. I remember when we were doing our translations for Old Icelandic, so Yo. it must have been like Völuspá or something, but I can't find it now. It was like one throwaway sentence that said like the gods came from the east. Uh, and yeah. it like always yeah. stuck in my mind where I was hey. like, is that like an hey, explanation I, uh, that like build a flower? Reli oh. like Norse religion I, came from like mainland hey. Scandinavia hey. over to Iceland and hey. that they're talking about that in like an Icelandic hey. context or we're was that like a Christian shops. intrusion where like on maps so. Eden is always yeah. placed to the east. Also Troy is also to the, always to the east. Uh, is it really? Yeah, I mean it's Asia Minor. Unless you're so. Snorri Sturluson then Troy is the middle of the world. <laughs> yeah I mean that's medieval Snorri. cosmography for you. Uh, yeah it's, and Troy I, is I just, just never like I couldn't place whether or not that was like an explanation for like, oh, like we came from the east because like Iceland got settled from Norway or like 
that was just like a Christian intrusion of like, well, Christian God is like located at least in terms of like Genesis in the Garden of Eden. Like, mm, is so that a Christian down. intrusion? Because that you have like sense. other Christian intrusions that happen all the time in Norse mythology. And like, is that just like an allegory to like Eden being in the East? Yeah. And we won't ever know because it got written by one dude. Uh huh. And we can't prove anything. And that's part of what's uh what's frustrating, specifically about you know Irish mythology, is like, well, we have the Book of Invasions, and we can't trust anything in it, I guess. Uh, so like, the you know it it you know like you said, it's got a God War. It's got um uh you know the the Tua Didana versus the the Favra, but at the same time, it's like. You know, we have historical context for that if the Fovra are like, oh, this, this is anti-Norse, you know, this is this is their heathen gods. But at the same time, that doesn't necessarily the, discount the, it from the, the parallel. The, the, that just means we have more context for it. I mean, the, the Fovra uh, are older. Uh, it's just that they were the yeah. same as the Tuada until yeah, the, they aren't yeah. at war until the ninth century. Well, that's what's really interesting, because, like, if you read through, you know, the Book of Invasions doesn't internally make sense. Parts of it are clearly propagandized, parts of it aren't. Uh, parts of it are retellings of the same thing. Uh, and if you're sort of reading through it, trying to track the timeline, it's like, okay, well, this first thing where it's like, they're the children of Noah, it's like, okay, that's that's some hot bullshit. Okay, cool. These, these, these suspiciously specific named characters, these three women and their three husbands who ruled for the 40 days they were there before they all drowned, that's that's some hot nonsense and then the next one is when it starts becoming like okay this is actually kind of interesting you're starting to get more groups of people that actually seem like there's something real um and you have the tua the nanan arriving together and the fovra are already there um but the, and and it goes from like oh the fovra are just kind of like they're they're monstrous uh you know invaders to like not only are the Favra just kind of another group here, maybe we, we don't like them very much, but they're here. Like, we've intermarried with them, and uh, <laughs> one of them is now our king. And it's like, okay, hold on. Like, are they your enemies? <laughs> or are they the original inhabitants of here? Or are they your in-laws? And it's right. like, all of those things yes, are true. all three. Yeah, but that's the thing. Like, that implies that it's, it's sort of a catch-all group for, like, the yeah. the other group of gods. You know, you could easily parallel them to the Vanir in that it's like, they're the, they're the other ones. Ones, you know, sometimes we have we another them, correction. We uh, also from Emmett, who is a PhD candidate in this. The Fovara aren't native to Ireland. That's the thing that's been started into cultural memory by a journalist in the 20th century. What? That well, new on that journalist? Uh, I don't know if that's true because they're in the Book of Invasions, and that was not invented by a 19th century journalist. <laughs> or sorry, 20th century journalist. So much um. But I know nothing about right. Ireland. I, I read the whole thing cover to cover, including the fucking king list. Like, the Fovra are in there. Yeah, they're uh, in there. It's just they're not the native peoples of Ireland that the two well, okay. of them move on to. No, but the thing is, when you're reading through the story, it, it's like, oh, Ireland was completely uninhabited. And here's when the two of the Danans showed up and the Fovra are already there. And it's like, when did they show up? But, like, it, it's, a, it's a point where the story doesn't hold together because it's not intended to hold together. They're um, the, the, the same group of people. They arrive at the same time. That does not line up with what I remember from when I read it. Um, <laughs> like old water. <sighs> Give me more context. As, yeah, and so Emmett I, I is going to happily context. cover this one. Uh, we are. This is, however, a Norse stream, not a, yeah. not a Celtic stream. <laughs> right. I can lead it more. Nor come back, on, come back on Tuesday. <laughs> I sorry. I do think I know what just happened though, because uh, I. It was not my intention to indicate that I believe that the Fovara are like the old gods of Ireland what or whatever. What if you uh, came I think me? that the reason why this story doesn't hold together is because it wasn't yeah, written to hold together. And uh, at anyway. some point it becomes convenient to have a group of a eh, enemy in-laws, basically. So there's no explanation for where they come from, but that doesn't mean they were always there. Um, but it occurs to me that the way I phrased this might have made it sound like I took a side in a thousand year blood feud between archaeologists, which would make that about the fourth time this has happened. Oh, well. Uh, this is this. So in case someone's preparing their strongly worded comments, this... I th when I say the Favara are already there, I mean I read the damn book, and there's a point where the Favara just have shown up without explanation. Yeah, they do not have an origin story, uh, but. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but. Uh, you know, this this stream has been nothing anymore. but the hot take zone, so whatever. <laughs> <laughs>
I was gonna say, if you want to take it into like a more Nordic concept, there's that really interesting aside at the beginning. I think it's Lunt Nama book where they're talking about like getting to Iceland. And if nobody knows what Lunt Nama book is, that's fine. It's literally the land naming book. And it was just like a book that this guy wrote when like the nobility was moving from like Norway to Iceland and it tracked like, was it the 400 like rich families that came and it basically just talks about like how they divided up like iceland into like their little yeah family homesteads it's it's um, usually translated as the book of settlements because it's l land yeah. claiming not land naming uh oh, land yeah. claiming my yeah. bad my old icelandic is out <laughs> true <laughs> i haven't looked at her but there's it's, it it is in land number book where they talk about the papa right and, the, and like uh, also in Iceland. Also an Eastlanding book who's who has a version written by the same guy. Uh, Ari That Dornisle. might be the one. Uh, but they're then, like, they're they both in there. <laughs> it, either way, I remember this vaguely as if in a dream. <laughs> but I know what happened. Um, <laughs> and it came to me in a dream. <laughs> it came to me in a dream. My favorite footnote. Oh, uh, <laughs> but they get to Iceland and it. there's like... <laughs> what are presumably Irish priests, like, already living on, like, the south side of Iceland. And they're like, we were able to identify them because of, like, their weird, like, religious items that they have, which are presumably crosses, which, like, yes. you would not know what that is if you're not yeah. Christian. So they yeah. were like, hmm, they have these strange things that they hold and that they pray to. And then the next sentence is like, we ran them out of town. <laughs> they literally just were like, no, we live here now. It's said, be gone. Um, and it's very vague about how they made them leave <laughs> or whether any of them made it off the island alive at all. <laughs> yeah, he, they, they left to a farm upstate. Yes, they yeah. went to go be Christian somewhere else. <laughs> but it is such an interesting like idea because I think it rounds back to sort of that discussion we were having before of like claim to the land. Because like presumably those people were there first. <laughs> Before yeah, they got any, out, like, yeah. Vikings yeah. got there, and just because, like, they, like, the people coming from Norway had, like, the show of force to, like, make them leave, which, like, bold of you to be fighting, like, religious people who have no weapons. And well, then, I mean, like, we won. No, no, Ar Ari's <laughs> very, <laughs> Ari's very no, clear classic. that they leave peacefully, the uh, Ar because <laughs> Ari, right, Ari Thorgerson's writing in the, he's a priest himself, and so he's writing very clearly in the, uh, well, this land is Christian, right? Uh, and therefore, because this land is Christian, clearly Christians originally lived there. Uh, and they all conveniently left of their own accord, and our ancestors did not do violence against them, because that would taint the whole... And sure didn't murder them, because that would be a sin. That would taint the knows, whole the Vikings process. Would never hurt a monastery. No. <laughs> exactly. Never. Now, to be fair, the, they are uh, Irish ascetic monks of the kind of the Hebrides, so there's nothing worth stealing. Uh, but uh, Fair enough. <laughs> well, that does make things easier, but did they know that going in? Sure didn't. They were no. like, there's people here, and I want to build my farm here. I'm going to need you to leave. Uh -huh. <laughs> Uh, and then they built a farm there. <laughs> yes, it is a very, it is a very oh boy. fun history. Evan hit the character limit. <laughs> yep. It's just like the thing, like the weird thing is that like all this like really interesting stuff that like makes you scratch your head is always just like a throwaway footnote. Of course. Yeah. In like a story, like the gods came from the east. What does that mean? We'll never know. Mm, they're Trojan nobody refugees. Ever expanded on that. <laughs> there were people nine living realms. here before we got here. <laughs> Who were they? What does it mean? We'll never know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The the night the... so frustrating. <laughs> exactly. Uh, but that's life, and honestly, I wouldn't have it any other way. No, I love I a good would. mystery. How else are, how <laughs> like else are we supposed to? Has a solution. You know? How are we supposed <laughs> yeah. to be perpetually in the hot take zone if there's a definitive answer that we cannot? Oh, argue I'll find about? new hot takes. <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> I know you will, but I I am not as talented as you are, Lynn. I need all the help I can get. I'm doing the acrobatics <laughs> to find the hot takes. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I, I think it's like this really careful balance of like, I would love for there to be mysteries like that that always exist and that like maybe like, like the thing with the cave, what the caves are trying to tell us. Maybe it's not meant for us and maybe we're never meant to know. But at the same time, I'm so goddamn curious. I just want to know. Just give me the answer. Make it simple for me this one time. No. <laughs> oh boy. It's kind of like how, you know, we want there to be like, mysterious ancient trap filled temples and lost cities and like 
we we want there to be really cool active stuff for us to engage with rather than yeah. just like we found a bunch of pottery shards true uh, yeah and a dead guy on the day <laughs> after the release of the indiana together. jones 5 trailer too oh, oh man. man i'm hyped <laughs> are they making a new one yeah they are it actually just, looks good it doesn't but... look terrible i'm sure well, with okay. harrison ford Yes. Yeah. Here's the thing. It doesn't, nasty. it doesn't actually show anything. The only reason that we all like it is because it has a slow building orchestral remix of the original theme. Oh, True. Uh, oh, it also has songs. Montage. It also has a quick montage of him punching Nazis, which you know we love to see it. But we like, love a throwback. Yeah, and, but and that's it, you know that's that's the only reason. It's an odd number in the you know Jones no. movie, and therefore it has Sala. And that's we a love it. Yeah. <laughs> It has the potential to actually be good. I cannot believe that they are bringing out a new one. <laughs> oh, uh, incredible. You say well, with I'm a Twitch this. account of Lindiana Jones. Yeah. Also, with the, with the return of the actor who played Short Round when he absolutely killed him everything everywhere all at once. Yeah. I'm really? Just, I love well, that. Well, he's not in the trailer, but like he could be. He's, he's acting be. again. He's uh, acting again. Excellent. God, I hope so. It would be so fun. I think we're How to another funny. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Good there. <laughs> They're just like bringing back everyone. Like the new, what was it? Jurassic Park had like everyone from yeah. like Christ. the original in it. Have not seen it. Scared uh, to. Why would you? <laughs> I'm terrified that it's going to be like the worst one yet. And that I'll just be like disappointed. I mean, they all make a billion dollars, but like none of them At are good. At what cost? Yeah. <laughs> At what cost? We're still talking about Fallen Kingdom or Lost World or whatever it was. Not I don't me. know. No. That's because the first movie peaked. Hey, what if there were dinosaurs again? Fuck yeah. That's all we and need. And they did it so good. And then they followed it up with like five more movies. And I was like, no. I, got your back. I think I actually, I watched Jurassic World uh, and wasn't particularly impressed. <laughs> I've seen all of them, I think, oh, at God. one point or another. Not like collectively. I think like the original three I watched like together at one point because they were already out by the time I became aware. And then like the new the new one, the one that came out like before Dominion, I saw that one in theaters. Mm -hmm. And it was not great. Yeah. No, none of them are great. No. The original Jurassic Park is good because it had to prove itself, but after that everything was just riding on its coattails. Well, they did it so well with like actual like full animatronics and things that read as like real to the human brain. Like you can yeah. tell looking at something when it's CG if you put it up next to like an actual human being. Yeah. Or like an actual real surrounding you're gonna be like mm, mm, one of these things is not like the other and it's the velociraptor it's got those little uh imperfections of movement and design that are yeah. what tells us subtly like that's a real thing really moving through space um which is so fun i i just generally recommend to everybody that they check out the uh the uh, corridor crew series that are like the yes. other side react yeah because uh, uh one of the ones they did semi-recently was like just unpacking like the sam raimi spider-man uh mm -hmm. two uh with doc ox arms specifically which are sometimes cgi sometimes practical um and there's just like a little detail uh where one of the uh, in like the first scene when he's in like the hospital and the arms have just gone wild and killed all the, the doctors or whatever and uh one of them sort of reaches out and like pulls the little blindfold off him and there's just this tiny imperfection to its movement as it's like moving along a track that's got a little bump yeah. on it and the animators were like oh my god if i thought to add that i would be bragging about it for a week and it's just like there's no effort at all to add that to a practical effect it's an imperfection of the physicality but if you're doing perfect cgi there's right yeah yeah, it's gonna so, run smooth and your brain's gonna be like that's not right give me the wiggle i need yeah. the wiggle to know and, that it's real and there are ways to like add you know noise yeah. to movements okay. to make them yeah. not perfect smooth yeah. arcs Ready but even then it's here. like you know it, it's not there are ways for cgi to almost perfectly replicate reality but after a certain point certain effects are just easier to do uh, physically yeah, yeah. no I, yeah. I think there's definitely things that like no, cgi has gotten like incredibly good with like landscape like any sort of mm -hmm. like inanimate kind of things like, like for you i'm sure the new avatar movie regardless of what like the plot is going to be like just from the terms of like the cgi like that landscape is going to look stunning yeah because like we've made such huge strides but then there's things where it's like human faces you're fighting three million years of evolution of the human brain knowing how to identify a human face 
Like, yeah. you're not oh, gonna beat gonna that. You, Even with, like, a deep fake, you can still tell that, like, that's not entirely a real yeah. living, breathing human hey, being looking yeah. at me through the camera. Which oh, is man. fascinating that, like, you can just look for an instant and be like, that's not a real person. Uh -huh. Yeah, especially if it's moving. You're yeah. like, something's not right. It's like, it's just, it doesn't have, like you said, like, the intricacy of, like, detail that, like, a human face is. Because it's like, if your yeah. mouth moves, muscles up here are moving. Like, your hair is moving because like your scalp is attached to the rest of your face uh, and if you're not yeah. thinking about that it's never gonna move right and just no. like the sheer amount of time and effort it would take to animate all those like micro movements it would into be ridiculous. every single scene Where it would be insane yeah. That's why every animator i'm aware of tries very hard to avoid having to That's animate adorable. a photorealistic human yeah. face that you can contrast with real human faces around it. It's like, that's a nightmare scenario. You have to make it as perfect as everything else, and there's going to be comparisons. And, like, a lot of it doesn't bother me so much. Like, I saw Rogue One, and I thought they were being cute with Peter Cushing. That's the one then, I was thinking of. Yeah, they yeah. turned around, and I was like, I don't. I mean, he looks like a really good cutscene. Uh, yeah. You know, it's, it's not, like, he, he doesn't, it doesn't bother me that much. And then, like, the de-aged slash digitally reanimated Princess Leia, I was like, yeah. yeah, okay. I mean, she looks like a really well oh, wow. done, like, I don't know, Madame Tussaud wax sculpture. Um, I think one of the really, really good ones with the de-aging that they did was um, Captain yeah. Marvel, where they made Samuel L. Jackson it. look yeah. like a little younger. That one was done really, really here. well. That was very Me impressive. Uh, sorry, yeah. uh, Emmett just got, uh, we got part two of the Emmett saga. Oh! <laughs> uh, Slavra and LG are first referenced when they show up in the Nemedian section. Yeah, that, that lines up. Uh, we have this line, he went through battles against the Fomereg or Sea Rovers. Battle of... Ba Bav Bavka in uh, this section is in the brackets has confused people because it is badly marked. It isn't a translator's comment. It is the original text. Ah, the text reads Fomor or Favara. Okay, that is to say Sea Raiders. So from the very first mention, they are being framed as basically Vikings. Ding. <laughs> okay. Going to interesting. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay, we had fireflies. Uh, they're very pretty. <laughs> yes. So now that I know uh, how to get back here. Awesome. We have yeah. also been going for three hours. How are you all feeling? Because we can't keep going because we're about to get um more giants. Uh, uh, but if we are, if we're reaching a logical stopping point, I think yeah. I really need to eat food. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> no, it's fine. I had a decent breakfast. It's just been a while. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, girl, exactly. Uh, a shortcut. So we are. Good girl. I mean, we're about to see the setup for the Believe next uh, build up to the next boss, right. but I forgot how long this section is. There's hmm. a lot of running around doing random errands. <laughs> well, somebody in chat just asked a good question. Yeah. Are there some translations right, of the you. ancient texts that people would They're recommend? Really Ooh. For the pros, I uh, Anthony Fox's is the yeah. best. Uh, yeah, for the poetic yeah. idea, I prefer yeah, Caroline yeah. Larrington's. Also me. <laughs> <laughs> Do we want to pop those mm. names and authors into yeah. chat? Okay. That would be a good idea. Oh, what? invisible. A wolf has also been got by someone invisible. I'm sure that's unimportant. Huh? I'm sure that won't matter. You'd think she would have mentioned that there are spooky, invisible people in this forest. <laughs> nah. Okay, we can see the author of LGE is immediately describing them as sea raiders. You're right, they're Vikings, but this just really confuses people when they do modern retellings because people very, very reasonably read it as an author comment. All this reference to the Favara has them as the farmers of the fields beneath the earth, which that? is very weird. This seems to be because Favara, Tude, Alshi all were the same conceptual unit initially. Okay, that actually lines up with what I sort of knew about this, which is like... There are all these versions of like, these are sort of magical, spiritual beings of the land. They're, they're like, they're genus loci, sort of. Um, but they're all basically the What's same group. Yep. Anyway, uh, as we're wrapping up, I do want to talk about the figure that we just got. We'll talk about her again next time. Uh, but they did just say that Grilla whispered its soul away. Oh, right. This is the thing you mentioned. Grilla. Kind of where she lives? Uh, seasonally appropriate. What are you gonna do? Chat, you, I don't know if you know this, but I stuff. have a tiny Christmas tree over here because tis the season. Oh, uh, oh. <laughs> but uh, there, uh, Grilla is an Icelandic, nowadays is best known as Icelandic Christmas troll. 
the mother of the Yola Sveinar. Yep, yep, yep. The, the <laughs> wife the of Leopold. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. The wife of Leopold, the lazy uh, troll, and the one who will, the person who will show up and steal all the naughty kids. Yep, she'll eat them. In an episode of Hilda, everybody should watch, watch it. Out. <laughs> yep. So we don't have time to go into super detail because yeah, there's like another thirty minute section of oh boy. busting into Grilla's house. Uh, so I think it may have to wait till next time. Yeah, it sure is my bedtime. It's about me so we will. Here. Oh boy, we will uh, murder all of these uh, random screaming zombies and Good. then Hooray! Ha them They're having been murdered. Mange. I think we shall. Inform people if you want to know why the hell there is a uh, Icelandic Christmas spirit in Yarnvillir in indeterminate mythological time. You should come back. You should come back next week. Yeah. You should also come yeah. back next week because we're going to have uh, Dr. Declan Tiger on. Yeah, you are. Uh, who wrote one of my favorite books about Norse mythology, uh, or old Norse religion, I should say. Uh, how Thor lost his thunder. So if you also yeah. want to hear spicy takes about how Thor may or may not be a thunder god, uh, we won't see Thor on stream, but we will get to talk about him. Sorry, quick note, Emmett finished the thought. Yes. Uh, <laughs> he sure four comments in. Good. Uh, sorry, I love the Fovita and other instances of how history influences these stories. It's a big part of my PhD. Talking about how the hero stories are influenced by changing cultural traditions and also the Norse. The massive amounts of Defend Ireland from Overseas Invaders stories is coming out of that. Which is, of course, very interesting because that's the whole premise of like the cyclic, you know, the, the book of invasions. Yes. Um, but the idea that like the Favara are not like they were the original gods and then they were replaced. It's like, no, the, the Favara were part of the group that is also, you know, the, the other gods, but also they got sort of recast as Vikings, I guess. Uh, oh, what a confusing mess. Anyway, very confusing cool. Mess. Thanks for the details. Um, exactly. Uh, yeah. We also have one more question that had bits attached to it, so I do want to try and get to that. Uh, mm -hmm. The Norse parts of the Viking Age, wo age we were, were not in interested do uh, in providing clear cut definitions of words like Alvar, Dvergur, or Trot. Uh, mm -hmm. What traits do we are associated with those terms, or are they all fuzzy? Uh, a thing we will also it's talk so about more last week. Changed. I recommend listening to the one a couple weeks ago uh, so about. Or with Dr. Felix Luma, because that's, uh, we talked about that with him quite a bit. But there are, like, piles of associations that get associated with each of these beings. Uh, but they are piles of associations, uh, and not single coherent or stable categorizations. Uh, there's also a wonderful article by Aurman Jakobson on that as well. Lucky. Oh boy. Our boy Alvin. Also, if you believe Snorri, he's like, the light elves live in turbo heaven, the they better heaven, <laughs> above heaven, which is like, oh yeah, that doesn't smell Christianized at all. No. Mega I'm heaven. sure those aren't angels in your cosmology. Anyway. It's what? because they're light and pure and not dark and living underground. Uh -huh. exactly. Which is also seems to be a distinction that nobody before Snorri drew. Anyway. <laughs> yep. Uh, I don't trust elves farther than I can throw them. I, I don't stop trust Snorri farther than I can <laughs> throw them. Uh, I was hoping we would get to a nice vantage point to end, and instead uh, a wolf and you a tassel. You got another boss yeah, Instead arena. we're in the pit. Another arena another of me. another tassel <laughs> Yay! The never-ending slew of mange bears. Exactly. Look, this is a werewolf. It is the most mange bear. Uh, <laughs> it's a mange man. And uh, the tassel worm is only slightly better. <laughs> it's a snake with mange. Ah, there's two tassel worms. <laughs> no! <laughs> I mean, that sounds right. It's transcended. It's risen above and become a legend. It's <laughs> managed to develop a bacterial infection reserve for animals that have fur. Exactly. I mean, Incredible. it is a tassel worm. It is a cat snake, so I believe. Nightmare. <laughs> Nightmare. <laughs> I've got this. Uh, Good job beating that. up that, that mangy bear. Amazing. Mm -hmm. Having beaten up the mangy bears, here. uh, I think this will be where we call it up. We'll pick up next time with more, uh, Grilla action. Okay. Amazing. Awesome. Amazing. Woo! Uh, as we wrap up, Lynn, do you have any final Your comments or thoughts, uh, about you? this game and your time joining us here on stream? 
I had a very good time. I'm very glad that you guys had me on. I like yeah. the game. I think it's very cute. And I think we had some good discussions. Yeah. This was super fun. Yeah. This is super it was fun. really, really fun. Yeah. Uh, Call me again if you have a hole in your roster. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> Amazing. Ooh. So, uh, we'll pick up with this uh, on Friday with Dr. Declan Tigert and also uh, whoever else is available, so I hope you all see us then. As we wrap up, a couple of final housekeeping things. If you like this, do hit that follow button. I stream two to three times a week. A variety of games, mostly Pentiment. But on Tuesday, <laughs> it's going to be a Sad Screen Valhalla with a whole bunch of guests, and one of whom is Emma222, uh, our resident Woo. Irish mythology everything. As we, for the last time, play, we play the last chapter, reminisce about that whole playthrough. So I hope you will all join us then, and then we'll be back with this, and then more Pentiment uh, later in the week. Hold on, wait, sorry. Person in chat was just like, wait, parallel between Odin and Balor that uh, Red pointed out. It's like, wait, am I right about that? With the Fovina being like anti-Viking propaganda? <laughs> was that actually true? No. Oh my god. <laughs> it's complicated. Uh, ah. Ah. I feel like that's just the tagline for what this episode was. Son it's complicated. Bitch. True. Uh, ah. But yes, do you subscribe? Uh, do you consider subscribing? Uh, your support is super appreciated. And yes, thank you, Red. Thank you, Lynn, for joining me on this. Thank you, everyone who came out and hung out in chat. And until next time, adieu. Yeah, thank you for having us. Yeah.